Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pamphlecon Box Report. Um, after taking a week off, we're back, episode 170. Um, I'm your host, Michael. Joining me this week, um, Gail from Communities Digital News, Scorsese. Uh, we're going to have some others uh, join us uh, later on uh, as the show goes along. Uh, what's going on? What's going on, Gail and Scorsese? Hey, we are back better, better than ever. Yeah, we're talking box. Yeah, a lot. A lot. A lot. A lot, a lot. <laughs> This past weekend is all over the globe. Uh, for those who are new to the Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, once again, live YouTube show, uh, as well as podcast blog, discussing all things boxing. Model is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if, it's, when, if it concerns boxing, we will talk about it. You want to find out any information regarding Pound for Pound Box Report, one main place you want to go to, that's the blog page, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com is the link. Check the right of the blog page. You'll find links to find our pages on uh, Facebook, Tumblr, uh, G+, YouTube, and Twitter. Also links to where to listen to us on um, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, Player FM, Google Play Music. Uh, let's get the show started tonight. A really loaded, loaded power pack show. As I, as I said before, boxing was happening all over. I mean, you could have... Uh, took something, um, a, a pre-workout that gets you a nice little buzz or whatever, and you just could have had a marathon and just stayed up all day and all night and, and watched boxing, and you still wouldn't have seen everything. Um, let's get the show started by, I want what I want to do is first focus on bouts in the States, and because there was a lot of boxing going on in Japan, I want to uh, then focus on all the boxing that took place in Japan, start off in the States, uh, HBO card. Uh, the headliner was Terrence Crawford fighting Felix Diaz. And look, and I'll go to you on this one first, Gail. For me, I, I when we talked about this, when we previewed this about two weeks ago, uh, Gail, and you can follow up as well, Scorsese. I, I, I thought that I thought that Crawford would win and win something like eight four, maybe nine three. I thought there would be moments where Diaz would give him a, a, um, a really competitive time, really tough time. And while Diaz, he landed some shots here and there early on. Um, but Crawford dominated here. Um, he stood there and fought Diaz more, a little bit more than I thought he would, to my surprise. Um, showboat a little bit, talked a little bit of extra trash. Um, it was like he heard the talk about how tough Felix Diaz could be. He fought up, he came in the ring with really something to prove. We talked about Bud and his um, infamous mean streak. I think it showed throughout that bout. Um, worked the head, worked the body of Diaz, stayed mostly southpaw, but really did a good job of just um, beating him up and breaking him down and ultimately finishing him. So, talk about Bud's win his pretty much thorough domination of Diaz. And let's get into some future here. Um, I know in the aftermath, they were asked about Pacquiao. They were asked about Ndongo. It looks like in the days after the bout, Bob Amherst trying to set up a fight with Julius Ndongo, who was in the building, by the way. Uh, Crawford Diaz took place at the big room at MSG. Um, so, yeah, Crawford's win the possibility of a fight with Ndongo coming up next later on this summer. Your thoughts, Gail? Domination, for anybody who didn't see it, hardly describes it. It was the classic cat playing with the mouse, you know, before it kills it for good and eats it. Bud was southpaw the whole time, as far as I could tell, never, never turned to orthodox against a southpaw opponent, Diaz, who's no slouch who's no slouch at all, not an easy win. And I agree, Michael, I thought Diaz would have his moments, would touch him up, especially early, because Crawford is a notoriously slow starter. Some would say slow, some would say patient starter. He He's there, he circles, he sizes up his opponent when he's right in the ring on top of him for the first few rounds, and then he gets to work. And Crawford just, took him apart. It was humiliating. Honestly, you could see Diaz almost visibly slumping, visibly crumbling round 
after round, Joel Diaz in Felix Diaz's corner was imploring him to, to get to work, to, to do something. And it just was going nowhere. Honestly, the fight could have been stopped several rounds prior. It was going nowhere. I mean, once you got past seven or eight, it really was done. Um, Diaz gave Felix one more chance, and it just didn't happen. And yeah, Crawford developed, you know, has developed quite the mean streak. Um, maybe he had all along, and you know, in the last three or four fights, we've really, really seen it. And he let it come out to play to the point that referee Steve Willis at one point told him to knock it off because he was patting Diaz on top of the head, you know, like like they're there, little man, and. Willis was like, no, 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 I'm not having any of that. But, yeah, he, he took Diaz apart. And it was just masterful to watch, truly. You know, the only other person in the last year or two I've watched who had a performance that I felt he was in that much command the whole way through, and I bet you're all ahead of me here, was Lomachenko in his last fight. Say very similar vibe to it too, where the dominant fighter is so in control, they start entertaining themselves as well as the fans. So what's ahead for Crawford? I agree, Indongo is an obvious choice and there's a real reason for that fight. Indongo holds the only belts that Crawford doesn't have. And so Crawford could do something in the lightweight division that's very, very rarely done in any division, which is an actual, honest-to-God unification. That is noteworthy. That is worth it. And, you know, Indongo's had two really terrific fights. Um, you know, a very, very solid, solid decision win in his last fight. And then that spectacular knockout of Troynovsky, our knockout of the year in, in my column, for 2016. So very smart of Ndongo to be there. He flew all the way from Namibia to be there on his own dime, by the way. He got a free seat, but that was it. And I'm sure being in Madison Square Garden for the first time, that's a hell of an experience. So very smart for him to be there so that if he is in a big room like that against Crawford next time, it won't be quite as intimidating for him. That's a really good fight. I don't see a Pacquiao fight. I'm real curious to hear what everyone else thinks, but I just do not see that happening. I really don't. Um, and, you know, Crawford is really on the brink of moving up a division. So, you know, whether the names being thrown around like Mikey Garcia or Lomachenko are still in play, who knows? I would love to see him fight at 147. The way he's going, yeah, that, that would be super exciting to me. We'll see what happens, but we don't really need to get too far ahead of ourselves. He's going to have a fight in Dongo, and I, I think that's going to be a very interesting matchup, and I'm perfectly good with that. Um, I see Joe, I see Bo from uh, Truth and Facts About Boxing has joined us. Uh, thanks for joining us, Bo. Because there was so many, um, so much boxing happening um, all over, uh, I'm going to split some of these fights uh, between uh, individuals here, but uh, with this fight particularly, um, with uh, Crawford, maybe another bite fight here or there. I'm going to give everybody an opportunity uh, uh, to chime in. Um, since you did just join us, uh, uh, Bo, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about Bud Crawford uh, and his win, his stop his win over Diaz, um, how he looked, um, as well as the future, and then you can follow up, Scorsese. Uh, Terrence Crawford, in in my opinion, the, uh, he has moved up to what you have to consider elite level skill set talent this felix diaz a lot of people don't know who he is so a lot of people are really dismissive of felix diaz but you're talking about felix diaz who is very tough he's a dog good skills good ring iq and crawford made him look average and this is the second time he's made good solid top quality b level opponents or top guys of his or, or, or top tough guys look sort of average because of his skill set his ring IQ is good. He's showing you he can do anything he wants in, in that ring. His awareness is good. So it was a very impressive victory because we've never seen no one dominate Felix Diaz like this. We've seen Felix Diaz give it to other guys like Lamont Peterson and Sammy Vasquez. So we've never seen him dominate it like this. Like 
there, and Terrence Crawford never let him get momentum. And whenever he looked like he might have had momentum, Crawford would jump on him, you know, and hit him with something. So it was an excellent, excellent victory by Terrence Crawford against a very solid guy that unfortunately nobody uh nobody knows but if you know if you follow boxing like we follow boxing you know felix diaz is nobody's pushover and terence crawford pretty much did whatever he wanted so um but as far as like the future for him you know what i i have to agree with with i came in on the end of gail so i have to agree with gail i would rather see him unify the division i think that just holds more weight from from him from a, a marketing standpoint, him being valuable, it holds more weight if he's a, a, holds all the belts in his divisions. The only problem is, will it happen? We don't know because the IBF, we know they have a mandatory for Ndongo, and that can get kind of crazy sometimes. And I think Terence Crawford ballooned back up to like a hundred and was it one hundred and fifty four or something like that? I know he ballooned up pretty high. Uh he was so he was. 157 maybe higher than that he was close to middleweight yeah so he ballooned up pretty high so that tells me and uh uh i think it, yeah, like gail said he could be moving up to the next weight division uh, uh within a fight or two <clears throat> but i would love to see him unify get all the belts it's something that we rarely see and, and it'd be one time we can honestly say okay we have someone that is the legitimate champion that holds all the belts in this division. You don't see that happen that much in boxing. So that would be good for him to see. I don't see a Pacquiao fight from this standpoint. I just don't think Bob Arum is like ready just yet to make that fight because there's some money he can still get out of Pacquiao. So he's not ready to make that fight just yet. He'll make that fight when the time is right. That's what Bob always does. He makes he makes fights when the time is right. But um if guys, like you say, like Robert Easton Jr., I know name came up, uh, Mikey Garcia. I saw an article that Mikey Garcia and Adrian Broner might be in the mix. I don't, I don't know how, how then on BoxingScene.com I saw that. But Mikey Garcia, Robert Easton Jr., uh, like you said, Lomachenko. I don't think if Terrence Crawford, because he ballooned up so high, I can't see those guys still being in play anymore for him. He's going to have to be going to 147. And if he unifies and maybe make a defense and goes to 147, then he the, his performance last night put a lot of guys at 147 in my opinion on notice because I don't it's really hard for me to gauge too many guys at 147 that has displayed that skill set that he displayed that that can compete with that that can compete with him on you know like that I mean I'm sure it's, I mean, it's just boxing anything can happen but when you look at it it's like who can we look at nobody boxes like he does nobody can switch like he does nobody uh you know. Uh, can give you all the angles like he does at 147. So it's it's interesting to see him go there. I would like to see him go there, but after he unifies. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's sad because he's beating dudes, and he should be getting a lot more coverage. He should be getting a lot more talk about. But because of the guys he's beating aren't well-known, a lot of people aren't really that excited about it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Bo and Gail. Um, and Dungo is the fight I want to see. I tweeted that right after the bout. Uh, uh, Bud Crawford and Dungo is the fight I, w I want to see at 40. Um, I, 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 I think Aram is not going to let that fight happen, not yet, um, in terms of Bud Crawford and Pacquiao, because I think, to you, precisely as you said, I think Aram still sees some more money that he can make off of Pacquiao. Um, so yeah, I'll go to you, Scorsese, and then you can follow up Daniel. Daniel from the Inscriber um, that's joined us. Uh, yeah, talk about Bud's win over um, Felix Diaz and, and the future for Bud Crawford. Um, soon to be undisputed champion or loser of all of his belts is need to be the future. He needs to have that fight with Ndongo. Ndongo, a real player, man. He's traveled to Russia, the UK, and final stop the US. He's like, whatever. He already made the trip. 5'11 junior welterweight and he can punch from all the way across the street. I want to see Bud Crawford deal with that. That's the shots he got hit with when when um, Diaz was load up the long shot. And Diaz ain't a long fighter. So I'm thinking, yo, what what if that's the boy in Dango? It was an impressive performance, though. I'm just trying to lead way up to that fight. Like this dude done and Dango done captured my mind. I don't know if he got the inside game. I think Crawford could step in on him and say, Hey, you you long, you hit me from back here. 
I'm gonna step in on you. I'm gonna work that body because Crawford got some vicious body shots. Uh, I I think he just throw him a little too. Uh, his volume on him ain't high enough. I think he throw him when people are hurt. I think he should be working them way more because they dirty. But uh, as far as the performance, whew, I'm sitting there watching that all, just thinking when the last time I seen somebody land this many clean punches. I mean, that just effective hard shots. You know, this dude's a knockout artist, and I'm thinking about the heart of Diaz, and he's like, he ain't went down yet. You know, he ain't wave a jet. He's in there every time he can muster something up. He's trying to, but he, he just getting beat to the shot. He's getting I, I tweeted this that he was gonna get hurt. I was like, yo, this dude before the fight, I'm thinking he's a good fighter. But the fact is, he, he can't do nothing to win this fight. There's nothing that I can look at and say this is what Diaz should be doing unless I turn him into somebody else. And Crawford showed me that I was 100% right. He just beat this man up. I felt Diaz probably should have just got on his back foot and made Crawford commit to him and try to, you know, try to outwork him a little bit like Porter does on the back foot. Porter ain't going to throw the straight right on the back foot. He's going to see you commit to a, a strong jab towards him, and he's going to throw five or six punches, and they might all be ugly punches. But it's going to flip to you somehow it's better than running into the shot being uh being a damn bull instead of the matador especially when you're the bull with a black eye and this man had two of them at the end of the fight and he had to hug his wife like that because crawford is bad man that's a bad dude man uppercuts hooks he was running in the jabs he, man whatever punch he wanted to throw it was down the table he just it was a buffet basically your thoughts daddy What well, I it turned out the way I thought it was going to turn out. As the fight week went in, fight week went on, I just kept thinking about it. I kept trying to give Felix Diaz a chance because, like I said, his toughness is unmatched. Like he would, he's not going to be the one to back down the bud. But unfortunately, eventually. Just like Lomachenko, just like with Golovkin, the outclassing shows itself. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And that's what we saw here with Crawford. And it was a when that was pretty, pretty quick. Because just the way he was beating... Diaz to the punch. And even starting the southpaw, he didn't even give himself a little bit of free time just to try orthodox first. He went straight to southpaw. And I said that probably the fight will be over the minute Crawford turns southpaw. But he threw combinations. He countered when he needs to be countered. And from the, thick, the fifth or sixth round on, he just just commence target practice on Felix Diaz. Now, I have to give props to Felix Diaz in the sense of like he didn't he didn't go down into the night. He kept himself up as much as possible, but luckily Joel Diaz, his trainer, recognized when to stop. Because there was no point in me having this fight go the full 12. And it was a really, really good performance in Bud. Now we have to point out this is the big room in Madison Square Garden. It wasn't the full garden. I think the top, the top bowl was circled off. It was around eight thousand. I think around eight thousand fans. So it wasn't really a full house to see Bud, but it was more than enough people to do it. It was a really, really great performance. And if you want to talk about next fights. The logical one is Ndongo. It's the logical fight to make. The guy was already there. You guys are already talking. You just have to convince the IVF that Lipnitz is not the money. <laughs> Crawford is the money. Yeah, and, 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 and I, I think that it has a decent chance of happening. Uh, the bout is being proposed for for August, and the reason I say that that Aram has publicly uh, talked about he wants this fight for Blake Crawford. He wants it late summer, um, and 
well not and but when 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 promoters particularly powerful promoters like Aram want a certain fight to happen um and both fighters say they want that fight to happen um it seems to get made one way or another and they can find a way to weave around what the section and bodies want um maybe get uh i can't remember his uh um, Dungo's mandatory his name i'm uh excuse me i apologize but certain lip nuts yeah and lip well lip yeah lip nuts well, um maybe they can to remember him also to, you know take a pretty sizable uh step aside fee uh so for me i i, I think it's a decent chance a decent chance that fight will happen next yeah, it is a trash can that belt can go in. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, that remember, we we have to remember now. I know we didn't talk about this fight yet, but unfortunately, Dango is not in the position where he has two mandatories now. So you have to convince both the IBF and the WBA that the money's not with the mandatories. The money's with Bud, which should be an easy argument to make. WBA uh enforce gonna enforce uh relic versus Bartholomew rematch. So he, he just got the IBF, but I, I'm telling you, I trashed that belt in a heartbeat to go for two more, the lineal title and the ring title, and they'll probably pay him to drop that belt as well. Aram says, you know what, I'm sorry you had to do that. Bam. Smart but move. I'll go back for that later. No, because you wanna make the, the point to make that fight is to become the the guy that united all the belts yeah that's what it is that's what it is for the fans sake and for you know for every for all intents and purposes that's what it is until it comes down to you telling me i can't get my biggest fight you telling me you're gonna think you're gonna stand in my way and dongo's already talked about that's what's going his people he said that's basically what's gonna happen if they play hardball you know your belt's in the trash can i'll tell you the location you can go pick it up that's basically what he said I agree. Uh, let's let's move on, and this is where I'm going to start to uh, split some fights here between um everybody else because again there were so many fights that went down just all over uh over the past uh, weekend. Going to go go to you, Bo. Um, on the undercard of Crawford Diaz, you had Ray Beltran fighting um Marcelo, uh for a um, <laughs> scary knockout <laughs> um, in round two. Uh, Marcelo landed some shots here early on in round one, but then um, uh, the, the the left hook uh, from hell put Marcelo down and put him out uh, cold. He had to be uh, taken to the ER for concussion symptoms. Uh, sensational knockout by Beltran with this win and his previous win, which it was also another uh, early stoppage. Uh, is it Beltran making a case here that he's ready for another title shot? Uh, you know, that depends on who you ask and how you view it. The guy he fought actually really didn't, wasn't known as a power puncher because some of those punches Beltran was getting hit with, if it was somebody that really had some, some oomph behind that, probably would have hurt him. So Beltran, he, he, that fear wasn't there. And then it was just a matter that he caught and he timed him. So that was there. So I, I, I would have, me personally, I need to see him against a little bit more stiffer competition, like a, a high C level or low, like a, a high C plus level or B minus level guy before we put him in there, before I'm saying, okay, he's ready for a title shot. But I, I will give him, he's making a very strong case for himself with the way he's knocking guys out and on, back on the win streak. I'll definitely agree to that. And it was, uh, it, it, it was a statement that he needs to make to let everybody know he's back. He's serious. And, he's, and if you're trying to make a run for a title, well, this is how you do it. You look impressive in fights to get people talking <clears throat> and asking that question. And that's how you get, you know what I'm saying, back in that hunt. Because even if one even if uh, somebody's holding the title side, you know what, I'm just gonna make a, a mandatory, I'm just gonna make an involuntary defense, I'll fight Ray Beltron. Because like you said, because of his last two performance performances, nobody can really be mad at that because like, well, he's fighting a guy on the hot streak that's been knocking people out. So can't really be too mad at that if you decide to fight him right now. But um I'm I like what I'm seeing, but the question is. Can he do that once he starts fighting some of the 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 the, the second tier guys? Once he starts fighting some solid second tier guys, then we'll see if he's really ready. Indeed, and I want to say before we move on, I'm also on this card. Uh, 
uh, Shakur Stevenson, uh, Stevenson uh, fought his second professional bout uh, for the knockout of a guy by the name of Suarez in the first round. Um, I'm going to you, Gail. Um, we're going overseas here, go over uh, London specifically. Uh, Javonta Davis making the first defense of his IBF junior lightweight title against a uh, mandatory challenger, Liam Walsh. Uh, look, I thought Wal I thought Davis would win and win ultimately by stoppage, but I thought that Walsh would give him some problems here and there. Uh, first two rounds were kind of filled out to me, but in round three, uh, the power of Davis showed itself. Uh, struck with thunder. Uh, got, he hurt Walsh, and once he hurt Walsh, he didn't let off the hook. Let him off the hook. Some may have argued that the stoppage may have been a little bit quick. I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, uh, overall, uh, the fact that <laughs> Davis went over enemy territory and, and won and won by stoppage, he was a couple of answers overweight, and he kind of clapped back at me about that on Twitter, even though I wasn't technically wrong. It is what it is. Um, I, I, uh, Tank Davis. He did what he had to do. This is to you, Gail. Hmm. Are you there, Gail? And I see Gail has uh, uh, has uh, dipped out. So, uh, with that being said, uh, hopefully she'll come back. I'll, I'll I'll direct that question to you, Scorsese. Uh, I knew it was to Gail, but I was about to outburst when you said some people said it was too damn quick. What was they waiting on? The man had to be in the third row, him to be dead? Uh, what the hell? Too quick? Yeah, I get it. They paid for a ticket. They wanted to see a longer fight. Maybe that's what you say. But to complain about that, stop it, Liam Smith. Walsh? I, I, can't, I always say Smith. Walsh? Shit, he got washed. That's what it, Liam washed. That's his new name. He got washed. A uh, few a few rounds in, you just saw it. The quicker fighter could dart to the dart with the jab to the body. And I always say, anybody start landing the jab to the body on you, you in trouble. Cause they got everything else in range and set up, and they know exactly how to get in there and out of there. You in trouble. And uh, I was right this time. Second, third round, you start seeing them letting loose with the power shots and. Ain't too much to cover after that. This is a young man that maybe gets on the Floyd McGregor card and two million, three million people see him fight and, and you know, they say, hey, I want to see more of him. I hope they can do that for him and I hope he could get his weight and everything. I hope they, you know, get professional about that. Some of the decisions he's made outside the ring when I heard Floyd talking about people he wants to hang with, some of the rappers, and I'm just like, I don't know if that's the company you want to keep because at the end of the day, what rapper is Floyd not bigger than? He's bigger than all of them. So why why do you want to go run behind B-list rappers? Well, you know, if that's the path you're on. So I'm thinking to myself, you got to look at the big picture. And if he do, he could probably stay at the weight classes of 130, 135, and 140 for his whole career. And hell, it, power like that, speed like that. I don't mind him getting a little more experience. I say one, two more years, he should be ready to fight anybody. There should be no excuses to it. And uh, you um, kinda, Yeah, you kind of beat me to my question there. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you a follow-up. Uh, look, people consider, uh, everybody considers Loma, Loma Chico the man here. Uh, Davis is young. He's 21. Um, but you see the obvious talent and you see the punching power. Uh, Based on what you saw, Scorsese, and I see Gail has joined us, I'll give her uh, time to talk about this fight. How far away is he from challenging the likes of Lomachenko? Man, I, as a fan, I watch him in two months. and As a fan, I watch it in three months. But as a promoter, if I put on the promoter cap, I say, oh, my gosh, 22 years old. He's been in pretty good at this age. But I, I want to give him some more experience. I, like I said, if I'm a promoter, I think you take the – the I don't want to say the training wheels because this man be the legit champion and a legit challenger. But you take off the uh, – uh, what would I like? To, no caution. Say forget it. Throw the caution out the window. I think you can get Gary Russell to move up to 130, and you can do like a, a big fight for the East Coast. Uh, Tank Davis versus Gary Russell. You know, maybe Gary Russell says, look, he ain't ready for me, so he ain't ready for Lomachenko. Maybe, you know, those are the type of fights you would like to see build to that. If You know, because, of course, they're not going to do it in three months like I'd like to see. But with power like he has, speed like he has, 
Man, it could be anybody that gets hurt like that. That that's real thudding power. Those are heavy hands. And when you see a guy take a shot on the ear, man, that referee, man, he could have stepped in way. He the first knockdown, he was looking like, oh, should I let this go on right here? Come to me this way. Come. Then he said, okay, go out there and get killed some more. And it is what it is, man. Anybody can be like that. So, I mean, interesting to hear what others got to say. But I, I like Tank. I like this. Like to see some growth in them and then two years it's like go for it bro it's other belts i think if lomachenko wants to unify it's other belts he could like the corrales fight would would that's the basically number one guy in the division and also the golden boy fighter can't think of the name right now but uh fighting um miora those guys are experienced and they should be willing to get in those big fights because they kind of been there before uh, I'll go back to you, Gary. I, I, you may have some technical issues on your arm. Um, and uh, talk about Javante Davis and his win over Liam Walsh. Absolutely. First of all, let's test that mic. Everything working all right, guys? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> Excellent. You know, what I was so impressed with, I mean, the power was superb, uh, the, the punch selection, the placement, the fact that he knocked his opponent down with the left hook who barely got back up, and he put the second one exactly in the same place. That is difficult to do. All that aside, what I'm impressed by is the increasing patience and maturity he showed. He could have run across the ring in the first round and had at it. He didn't. He spent two rounds, just like Terrence Crawford did in his fight, sizing up the opponent, getting a good lay of the land, and then he got to work. That, that is what will serve him well as he moves up against more difficult opponents. That was what was so impressive. And, you know, whether that is, you know, at the hands of his mentor, Mr. Mayweather, or whether that this is his uh, normal progression, you know, in his career, he was a pretty wild child as a young fighter. In fact, I had a lengthy discussion with him at one point about him you know, dancing on the grave of one of his opponents one time when I thought it wasn't appropriate. And, you know, he he has really matured into his role. I think a lot of it, too, is because of serving as a role model for his community in Baltimore. I think he feels the weight of that, and I think that's been good for him, really good. It's part of his emotional development. So do I want to see him thrown against, in against Lomachenko? Oh, hell no. Not yet. No, 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 no. I mean, I give the, I give him all the credit in the world, maybe for feeling ambitious enough to do that. I'd like to see him against some mutual opponents of Lomachenko's first, which is a great way to see where you stand. So I'd like to see him against Tevin, Tevin Farmer. That's a grudge match. Farmer, that'd be a good one. But I'll tell you who I'd like to see him against. And, and these are you know, a little bit still in the testing him range, but... I wouldn't mind see him, seeing him against Rocky Martinez. I wouldn't mind seeing him against Nicholas Walters either. You know, that would be a very interesting fight. Walters needs to redeem himself pretty badly. And I think he'd take just about anything. You know, whether he fights the winner of Bert Schelt, Mura, I think that would be a little rich for him too. Those are, that's going to be a barn burner fight. Um, you know, you have Corrales coming up here on this big triple undercard uh, with Burchelt and Mura. You know, who knows? But there's a lot of potential. He's worked his way up into the top 10 of the division. Um, you know, and he's a fresh, exciting face. It's just all good. It's it's just good for boxing all the way around. Uh, this this uh, Davis um, Walsh card was kind of part of a, a day-night affair. Um, on Showtime, uh, Davis Walsh uh, was aired in the afternoon live here. Um, later on in the evening, you had a card in Oxon Hill, um, headlined by Gary Russell Jr. Um, fighting Oscar Rascondon. Um, I'll go to you on this one, Daniel. Um, Russell, uh, look, Rascondon, he's a tough little guy, physically strong, but but you saw the superior, uh, Walt, Russell, excuse me, uh, pretty much do what he wanted to. Um, I thought he was fairly impressive, particularly coming off of a year layoff. Uh, stopped him in seven, uh, TKO. Um, and for me, I look at Wall, I look at Russell and, and, and how he's fighting. Um, his his whole his aesthetic, the way he's carrying himself. Um, 
put him right there in the mix at one one twenty six with um, any of the top dogs. I would love to see him in the ring against any of them. What first stands out is the size difference. Yeah, five, Gary Russell Jr. is five foot four, but that's gonna is five foot one. And you could tell the size difference was immediate when you got into the ring. And second, you still see them a bit of improvements that he's doing under Ruben Guerrero as far as boxing, as far as getting combinations better, not just being an all out brawler like most Colombians are known for. But there, there was no way he was going to be able to match that hand speed of Gary Russell Jr. There was no way he was going to match the power of Gary Russell Jr. It makes it, it's similar to what we saw with Bud Crawford in the way where the opponent gave most of what he had, but it's a, you could tell it was not going to be enough. In Neskinov's case, you could tell it was not going to be enough. And it ended in a pretty decent knockout. I, some people can question the way the stoppage was going because they didn't think that Eskinov was going down. But the guy was laying on the ropes. And it was about to be over in that round. So I completely agree with the stoppage. The fight was pretty much academic at that point. But Eskandon, let's say he gave it his best. He landed on some punches with Gary Russell. And he showed, like I said, good, good tenacity. But there was no way he was going to beat him. Not with that hand speed. Not with the way that Gary Russell Jr., when he has to, he turns it on to get you out. But he played it. He played it safe enough where he didn't let Eskandon land any, any surprise shots. That could rock him a bit. So I got to give him respect for that, and hopefully, like I said, this doesn't become, like, just the annual sighting of Gary Russell Jr. The guy needs to be in the ring. He needs to get, in the ring. Hopefully, late summer, early fall. Hopefully, it's hot unification. Because as talented as the guy is, you can't just keep wasting it just one appearance a year. Yeah, um, you're right. And um, that's the key for Russell. You know, he's too talented of a fighter to just be fighting um, once a year, maybe twice a year. We need to see him uh, more in the ring more uh, against better competition. Like I said, I would throw him in there in the mix with the uh, the Mars and the um, Santa Cruz and the uh, Framptons and and, and, and the like there at 126 because I think he's, I don't know if he'll beat all of them, but he's good enough to be competitive with any of those guys. Um, I named this uh, episode Good, Bad, and Ugly, and I'm going to you, Bo, and I'm going to give everybody the opportunity to talk about this. We're going to talk about what was has to be considered the ugly and what to a lot of folks kind of marred uh, the weekend. Braille fighting, it was good. Uskotegi, um, Darrell won by DQ8. Uskotegi landed a shot um, after the bell, slightly after the bell. And while the fighters themselves were, you know, kind of made amends and were cool with, you, with each other, uh, it was Darrell's uncle and his actions after the fight um, that left an ugly stain on box. I mean, of all the boxing that was talked about, what got the mainstream coverage, what Andre, Durrell, what Andre Durrell's uncle did, his uncle slash trainer did to Oskotegi um, after the bout. And what, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, melee ensued. Uh, Durrell's uncle stepped to Oskotegi, um, hit him with a two-piece uh, while Oskotegi was, wasn't even thinking about it, was unprotected, hit him flush in the jaw. Um, he fled the scene. Um, I don't know if they arrested him or not, but the police were looking for him. Um, Andre's brother, Anthony Durrell, so reportedly got into it, into a fight and beat someone up in the crowd afterwards. So it was already bad enough that Andre didn't look that good in the bout. Um, I had Uskotegi winning. Um, Durrell, he, just, he was just off for some reason. I don't know what it was, but not just that, but was after the bout to just kind of make this thing um, "Quote unquote ugly." First, you, Bo, and then everybody else can chime in. Um, 
Yeah, you're right when you say the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, there's also another fight that I hope you hope me. You hope I really hope you chime in on because I got a lot to say about that. That that shit really disappointed me. But see, the, here's what I want people to understand because there was a lot of people that was saying that, you know, he deliberately hit him after the bell. I'm like, okay, you know, and sometimes you have to ask, and, and I know people hate hearing this because when you say it and you're a purist or you're an enthusiast, they think you're being, you're being funny, but I'm asking, like, how many of y'all actually do no boxing? Because if you look at the fight, first of all, the referee was completely out of position. Yes. That ref should have been a lot more closer, okay, because you give the 10-second warning and you're standing there. Like, if you watch Tony Weeks, he's right there to jump in and grab you. So, it don't go further than what it should. So the ref is standing there looking like he's watching the fight, like he's sitting in the fucking crowd or something. I'm like, what is this that dude doing? How come he's not right up on him? So Ostecki is, he throws the first punch. And if you're a fighter and you land that first punch and it lands flush, you can tell when that punch is landed flush and it hurts. So he can, he can see, okay, I hit this dude. He looked like he may be hurt. He lands the second punch. Now he's finishing off the combination and lands the third. And just as he was landing the third, before he landed it, the bell rung. But he's yeah. finishing off a combination because he feels he has an opponent hurt in front of him. Yeah, and, and it's the hard. Real... And it's hard. Excuse me, but it's hard to sit there and stop combination as the bell rungs. It's just not you know. You probably didn't even hear the bell. You just probably con concentrating on the combination that you're just throwing. Right. Well, you, you're not even thinking bell because when you hit a dude. And you, you hit him once, you hit him once, you hit him a second time, and you're connecting. You're like, oh, this dude might be hurt. You're not even thinking about it, bro. <laughs> you're thinking about, oh, let me finish him. And in my opinion, Darrell is lucky it wasn't 10, 15 more seconds left in that round. Otherwise, I think the dude probably would have stopped him. But he hits him, he hits him, and the ref jumped in. There was another thing the ref did that I agree with Pauly when he said it. I don't think the ref should have told Darrell and his team if, you, if he can't finish, we're going to disqualify the other guy. Now, I'm not saying Andre Jarrell is the type of dude that will, you know, would look for the easy way out. I'm just saying that shouldn't have been out in the open and been said. He should have said you get five minutes or whatever time, then let me know how you feel. So that was messed up. Then Andre, then Anthony and his brother got into a melee outside the ring. Andre gets up. He calms everything down. In my opinion... Andre gets up, he calmed everything down, he walked over to the team, he, 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 you know, he said something to them, he walked over to the guy, said something to them, everything had calmed down, everything was under control, right? And what happened? His uncle put him in a very bad position. Why? Because his uncle, and this, uh, excuse my language, but it was a punk-ass move what his uncle did, because he's walking over to the corner. He's, he never looked directly at the, the fighter. He's looking like he's about to talk to one of the guys on the rope, one of the cornermen on the rope. Then he turns and sucker punches the dude. And I'm thinking, I said, that's the, like the weakest fucking move in the world because you didn't make, a, because if he would have been making a beeline like he was going to go to the fighter, somebody would have got in between him and said, hey, he walked over like he was going to talk to the guy on the ropes. And he actually was looking at the guy on the ropes. And that's why nobody was in the ring. They didn't think he was going to do nothing because he's walking over there calmly. Then he, he just all of a sudden turns. And he sucker punches this dude. And now you put Andre in a bad position because after calming everything down, he's got to choose between, between a moral standard and family. And it was just so messed up because as his uncle, as, as the more uh, you know, pro adult person, as whatever you're supposed to be in this corner, you're supposed to not put your fighter in that kind of position. And you did. Why? Because you felt something is what it is. That's what the commission is for. That's what, you know what I'm saying? That's what the commission is for. That's what everybody, that's what that shit is for. You go through them channels. You don't take that, you don't do that shit in a fight, especially after it had been calmed down and put back in control. It was the most fucked up thing that, that he could have done because now Andre Durrell is probably being looked at getting a label on him because of association with family. So... But as far as the fight, I had Ustig, I had Ustig winning. And the thing about Darrell is he start he starts off slow. He was switching, and he started to come on. I remember watching this fight, and I said, I said at some point, at some point, because it always happened. I said at some point, Darrell gonna get his dude a chance to get, you know, you know, you know, what I'm saying to 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 really to really connect and land, and it happened. 
And Andre Durrell is very lucky it wasn't 10, 15 seconds left in that round. Otherwise, I think dude was going to finish him because that first punch really hurt him. He was hurt. That's the reason why he didn't move out the way for that second punch. And he was there for the third punch. He was hurt. He was truly hurt. Had he had any had more seconds, who knows what would have happened. But it was such a bad thing to happen because, like you said, you know, he apologized. He took something ugly and made it good again and apologized. And then it went bad again. I didn't like how uh, Darrell looked all night long. I felt early on, I didn't like the way he was reacting to um, Uskategi's, uh, and I apologize if, I, if I'm um, incorrectly uh, pronouncing his name, but Uskategi, I didn't like him from the punches all night long. He looked last l- lackluster. He didn't have the spark. Um, it looked like he was just barely holding on in there. And I'll go to you. Uh, uh, I go to you, Daniel. Your, your reaction, not just to the fight, but to what to the altercation and, and the chaos that ensued afterwards. I'm gonna go first to the fight itself. I do tend to agree that something felt off about Darrell. Maybe, maybe they thought that Ustekagi was going to tire himself out, or they didn't think that he was gonna put in the combinations the way he did. But it just looked off. Like, he had some moments. He did counter well sometimes. He did avoid some punches going as he was in the ropes at times. But it was a pretty close fight that Estegui was winning. And I'm going to try to lay overlap everything that happened here and try to judge everything through a clear lens. I think it was in third or fourth round at the end, the first time Estegui hit the rail after the bell. Referee stops the fight. He goes to his take his corner. Tells him no certain terms to a corner that doesn't know much English to begin with. In English, this is a warning. You do that again, there's going to be penalties. Now, here's the tricky part when this happened. Like Bo mentioned, this was... The way Ustekagi was starting, he was in the middle of a three-punch combination as he was landing it. To all the people that, that have done even slight shadow boxing at times, when you condition your body to throw certain combinations at times, it's tough for it to stop. That's one of those instances where it's tough to have your body stop because you built yourself up enough of a rhythm where it'll stop when it's naturally supposed to stop. But first of all, I, I don't think it should have went straight to disqualification. It, to me, should to me should have given that that five minutes to see if the rail was going to do fine. And then you already warned them, do the point deduction then. Take away a point. Looking at the scorecards, Stukagi would still would have been winning on two of the cards. And then they have one of the cards where you would have the rel up. But you give him a point, and then you just have it on his head. Next, if something like this happens again, then you can get disqualified. To go straight to disqualification, it's a pretty harsh, even though I understand why he did it. Like, he gave him a pretty stern warning at first. And then, the, and then the bullshit afterwards. First of all, Andre Jarrell squashed the whole thing to begin with. Went to Sigi's corner. He said, I understand. It's boxing. It happens. I forgive you. Sticky said, he said, thank you. You got to forgive me. And ultimately went away. Now, First, it was the Anthony Durrell situation, where apparently he pushed a member of the Maryland State Commission pretty harshly because the guy was trying to hold him back from coming to the ring to see his brother. And then the Leon Lawson situation, uh, I, I will, at first I want to say I know where they're coming from. I get where they're coming from because we have to remember this is not the first time 
something like this has happened to Andre Durrell. I remember very vividly when Arthur Abraham hit him while he was down. Yeah. And that has produced injuries that pretty much have left Andre Durrell not the same man. Both as a fighter and as a man. He's, he has to deal with consequences from that punch for the rest of his life. Because correct me if I'm wrong, he was out over a year um, yep. as a result of result of that um, um, illegal shot. Yep. So like I said, I understand why the family went crazy. They should have just stopped it the moment they saw Andre Durrell squash it himself. Because then when Leon Watson did that fuck shit, well, you, you should call it fuck shit, you should call it pussy shit, you should call it hoe shit. Because that's what it was. You go in there, you sucker punch somebody, and then you dip out, which by the way, you, if you cross state lines, motherfucker, that eliminates any statute of limitations to those charges. So now, you, so guess what now? You're a wanted man. The WBC has suspended you now, by the way, which means you can't be in Anthony Durrell's corner if he's even allowed to keep the fight against Callum Smith. And like I said, I understand why they did it. I get it. I understand it. But at the same time, you've just pretty much banished yourself from the from the sport you dedicated your life to, the de the sport you, your family has dedicated itself to. Because you chose to react emotionally and badly. Because, yeah, yeah as at this moment right now, it's true. Leon Watson is, Leon Lawson is not in custody. But except if he has crossed state lines, it doesn't matter because if you cross state lines against those charges, you just eliminated any statute of limitations that there are. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And if if, if I'm um, Anthony Durrell, given his actions, um, he has a title shot later on in this, in September. Um, he needs to be worried about whether he's going to be able to keep that title shot, given the way he conducted himself after the fight. Um, I go to you, Gail, and then you you score, Sazy. Um, your reaction to it transpired uh, with um, Andre Durrell and Uskotegi. So, so disappointing. For those of us who love this sport, who want to see it flourish, who want to see more people come to the, to the sport and enjoy it, this stuff so sets us back. That's what disappoints me the most. I... I completely understand how punches like this in a series happen after the bell. And we're not talking five seconds after the bell. We're talking fractions of a second. It's a natural follow-up. You want a boxer to have that killer instinct, that, you know, that desire to finish a guy off, the heat of the moment. You know, to me, looking at the replay, the truth was, I think the first two punches out of the three pretty much had Durrell finished off. He did not look good in this fight, as everybody has said, and I, I don't need to go over that ground again. So what Uskategi did was not, <laughs> not within the rules, but it, it certainly wasn't uh, malicious. He, I don't think he was playing dirty doing it. It happens. Shit happens. The referee was out of position. A good referee, when he sees somebody, you know, being, uh, you know, being targeted like that, the, the subjected to those sort of punches, you know, watch somebody uh, who knows what the hell they're doing, like a Steve Willis, like a Harvey Doc. They're right on top of these guys. That bell sounds, and they are throwing themselves between guys especially when there's action going on. They're very, very vocal about warning. Make sure that the boxers hear them warn them about the 10-second uh, uh, warning just sounding. And this didn't happen. So it all led to a bad situation. 
And then it was made so much worse. Leon Lawson Jr. committed assault in every legal sense of the word. That was an assault. There are warrants out for him. As of this afternoon, he was still on the lam, wherever the hell he is. And, you know, the fact that we haven't heard from him, nobody's seen him and that he's hiding, he knows what he did. He absolutely knows what he did. And if he was a real man, he'd stand up and admit, you know, that in the heat of, heat of it, he did something extremely stupid and face the music. You know, and that would clear the air for his camp. I do think, in retrospect, the governing body should go back, look at it, um, consider it a no contest. You know, let's just you know, scratch it entirely. It's just bad on both ends and deal with Lawson accordingly. In, in, indeed, indeed. A uh, sucker move by um, Lawson here. Um, what if jail time, uh, for me, money, take some serious money out of his pocket. You hit dudes, this is where you hit folks like that. Uh, you hit them in the pocket uh, where it really hurts. Don't allow them to work anymore. Um, then he'll hopefully get his act together. But that being said, Scorsese, um, um, that took away from Uskategi. That took away, away from a lot of what went down this weekend in boxing. Um, uh, to, to Bo's point, um, a sucker move on his part. It really was. Oh, oh. oh man. As I watch the fight more and more, I, I'm not going to worry about the performance of either guy because I think both guys are – B plus A minus look. Uskategi is a is a pressure fighting athlete. He ain't no slouch. <laughs> he was on his toes. He was keeping up with the athletic Darrell. He was there in his face. And I knew Darrell had faded, so I knew he drops those hands. I knew he had reflexes, but sometime he can get chipped. So I knew the fight was gonna be a good one. But Uskategi messed this up for me. Like Second round, he punted. <laughs> and we got an excuse for the second round, too, where he's looking directly at him. He's completely off balance, and he just says, I heard the bell, but you know what? I'm going to throw this straight left hand in your face anyway. And then on top of that, I think uh, middle rounds maybe. the I, I know about the third round, Darrell's walking back to the corner. He pats him on the head laughing like, you know, like you just didn't do this round before. And then I think it's the fifth. Or, no, it's the sixth round. Six round that I remember. He throws another punch on the after the bell, clean after. Misses the punch. Then the one that does happen. Then you go back to the dressing room, and the first thing that you think to say to reporters is, nah, he just quit again like he did with uh, Abraham. Oh, you had that, what you had that in the host of the whole time? It, it kind of makes Leon Lawson seem right. To say that's my family member. I know he apologized, but he got up out of he got up out of nowhere. He still his brains is scrambled right now. He's apologizing for something he's not understanding. He's not understanding you back to go to the dressing room and speak in your language. That didn't he do this before? Yeah, you act like you saw that video and was like, hey, they just blame him. And I, I, can't, hear, I, I, I wait a minute. Wait a minute. I hear you, but if Leon if Leon Lawson was really like that. As Bo stated earlier, you don't sit there and then step to him. If he was really that upset, you should have came up him and let him know. You don't sit there and act like, oh, it's all cool and all to the good. Hey, hey, hey my, the my argument to that, that my argument to that is this. That's weird. My argument to that is this. Uzkat, every time he threw three punches at the bell, he never tapped the rail on the shoulder of the referee and said, I'm going to throw these suckers late so you be ready. So – Leon Lawson, thinking in the spare of the moment, hey, he could go to jail and all that. I don't have to do the time, but all I know, if that's my family member, and I've seen him blur vision, headaches, career taking, money out his pocket, and then and then on top of that, if I know at the end of the day, you're going you gonna to go to the back room and make your jokes like, man, y'all seen him do it before. He just quit. He just quit. He's a quitter. And, and you can't go with that logic because wouldn't Darrell on the canvas rightfully versus James Gale? Did he quit that fight? No. Wasn't he rightfully on the canvas versus Blake Caparello? Yes. Did he quit that fight? No. It's other – um, Nick Brinson hurt him. Did he quit that fight? No. The guy that – um, Derek Edwards hurt him. Did he quit that fight? No. So you can't just ride with that logic. He gets hurt. It gets tough. He quits. Nah. This dude planned this. He did it three times. 
and he was looking for an advantage into the next round. The referee was 100% right. He stopped. He had to stop this three different times. And after that, it's over. No points, no nothing. You tell that man you go home. That's who needs to be suspended. Leon Lawson, they need to sit down and have a talk with him. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, if that's my brother, that's my nephew, hey, don't tell me how to react when I see you ain't giving us no warning and what, and what you're doing. I think he's completely wrong. I blame Uz Katagi. He's a grown man. When you box, you act in a civilized manner. You got three minutes to do your work. You don't have three minutes and, and, and point one seconds, point two. You got three minutes. He had all those three minutes. Darrell did everything right. Darrell's uncle, you could look at him like a thug. Hey, he, he could totally be all the way wrong. But I didn't see him doing this when there was no foul to him or his people. I've never seen him do this when there was a foul. When 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 they got in James DeGale's face, they didn't beat him up. They talked, they talked, they boxed, they shook hands, they went on. But when you you get your toes stepped on, I can't tell the person how to react no more. I I I can look at this as blatant behavior by Uz Katagi and, and you don't get to tell people how to react when you do blatant things, in my opinion. A uh, reaction to what Scorsese just said. Anybody want to comment? To be blunt, that just sounds like a cop out to cover what Leon Lawson did. No, no cop out. No, Leon Lawson can be a hundred percent wrong. Don't have to accept his punishment. One day, someday, somehow. But I can see exactly where he coming from. That's your huh. that's your blood, man. That you put your feud, he you let him pay for your children's school. If he Leon Lawson got kids, it's from Darrell's hard work and him putting in hard work with them. They bleed, they sweat, and they do that together. That's a team. You see no, about that's him, what, that's what I said. That's what I said. I understand it. That's why I said I understand it. They've seen what happened with Darrell with something similar happened before. Like I said that guy's not gonna be the same. For the rest of his life. At the same time, there are better ways to handle it, both legally and illicitly. There are better ways to handle it than to do it when everybody's watching you. If you're gonna do some dirt, you do the dirt. When nobody's watching you, I'm just glad his punches and the man wasn't dealing with bullets coming out the arena. Because when you got people with that heated, that's possibility. So I, I'm I'm glad he had to deal with a, a left hook from a non-fighter that couldn't knock him out instead of him coming out there. And you got the Goonies saying, "Hey, we don't respect that. We saw what you did in two. We saw what you did in six, and we saw the ending in eight. Now, now here's your ending." So he, he lucky, basically, is what I'm saying. He lucky. We shouldn't be sanctioning either one. I mean, no. it's a matter of degree. So what? Neither is acceptable in a civilized society. Guy, guys fight in the ring with rules for sport, for our entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they shouldn't be subjected to violence outside of the sport. End of story. We we don't we don't as citizens take the law into our own hands in the streets and that's what happened. But but that happens though. If we don't. It happens and it does it not so make much. it right. I understand no, why people are angry, but it doesn't mean that we all have license to do it. Just because we were wronged doesn't mean that in our civilized society we permit that to happen. But when a person the ends unjustified wrong, means basically. When Absolutely a person feels not. he can run or when a person feels he can run or when a person feels that he can do the time, those things are going to make it say, I got the right. And I, I know I'm not saying what he did. I won't say it's right, but I won't. I also won't say that Uz Katagi didn't deserve this. I think his behavior was flat out blatant. And I think family members, we can tell them how to act. And we we'll say that's our family right. having it to it. Um, I've heard you silent over here, Bo. Your reaction to the, to the discussion going on right now? <laughs> my honest opinion uh-huh by being scorsese i'm not surprised but um <laughs> that's my that's my honest opinion by being him i'm not surprised but here's the thing though here's the Damn. here's the thing here's the thing because he's saying it was blatant and mm -hmm. what usta take said after the fight well guess what the other team they don't know that going into the fight what this guy said they don't know yeah. what this guy thing they don't know any of that so I can't base my thought process off what the dude said after the fight. 
I can't do that. I can only base it off of what's going into the fight, right? So we don't know what he's thinking going into the fight. Okay, so that part, I'm just like, no, that's, that's garbage to me. Now, as far as the uncle go, I'm from the street. I got family members. You do something to one of my family members, I'm not going to casually walk over like I'm going to talk and sucker punch you. You're going to know I'm coming to fuck you up. Exactly. That's but what he he you're going to know he I'm coming to put you in a fucking hole. And to show you how much, and to show you how, to show you how much punk shit it was, right? He hit this dude with a flush knuckle shot and didn't phase him. So you a bitch anyway because you can't even hit a motherfucking hurt him. That's your intentions. But, but but he wouldn't have got. So, if he would have ran across the ring, he like you said, he wouldn't have got there. And then no, he, the point he being was you waited. The square says he he waited till after everything had come. This is the this this is why it's bitch shit. You waited like to after like he everything had calmed down. No, no, if no, he no, did no, this, he didn't actually, he was actually. Yes, no, I don't think it was no. A, let, let, me, let me make this point. I don't think okay. it was a flat out turned over sucker punch. Him and the trainer was not talking casually. They were arguing. They had hands out talking, and I feel like that trainer said something to him that made him just say, "You know what? The hell with this shit." So you, just, wait a minute. Okay, okay, wait a minute. If, if that's the case, again, I'm uh, from the streets. That's man to man. If no trainer says I don't like, I'm kicking your trainer's ass. I ain't fucking with you. I'm okay, fucking with him. That's man to man shit right there. That's what I'm saying. So it was bitchified because Darrell had already uh, Darrell had calmed it down. It, if it was in the heat of the moment, he did it fine. He waited till it was calmed down. He waited till everything was settled. He waited till there, nobody was in between them. That was a calculated thing for him. It yeah. was bitchified. That was blank. That's that's the same thing. That, that, like, I know yeah. was calculated. I can't yeah. say that it was a calculated move on Utate because guess what? I don't know what was in that dude's mind. I can't tell you what he thought in the back room. I can't tell you what he well, stop. But still though, I can't tell you it was intentional. Why? Because I don't know what he said in the back room. I don't know what that game plan was. I don't know that. But I know what I saw, what that bitch ass motherfucking uncle did. Bitch shit. So that's that's just how I look at it. It is. Well, it's I bitch shit. Like because regardless. Play. I feel like because regardless, if, if he did victim, him, if if, if he victim, did it to him three times, like you said, he did it three times. And guess what yeah. you do? A yeah. ref. That's that's the second time he hit my my my, my nephew. A ref. That's the third time he hit my nephew. He never did that. Not one fucking time, Scorsese. Not if one I, goddamn if time. Victim, if I'm the victim, I'm saying shit, man. I, if I'm being honest with myself, and I know I'm going in the back room, and I'm saying stuff like, look, he know what his intentions were. If his intentions were to do this, I feel like the man need to drop the damn charges because you was being dirty and what way hey, do unto us. He's not the one that put the charges business. up, though. The, 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 the commission, the commission put the charge up because it's assault. But yeah. the bottom line is you're talking about if, 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 fuck if. We don't know these things, Scorsese. We don't know what who's to tell. We don't know that. So that I, if, I read if, the quote. I read his quote. No, you, I right. Have, I, have the, 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 the Scorsese, I have hindsight. Scorsese, what I'm talking about is you're talking about some shit that you've read after yeah. it happened, not yeah. during the process or before. Well, it's, not the like say before the fight. The tape. it's not like they said, here's the tape. Watch this before the interview. No, he seen did it. Uthi, did and, and, and he, and he say, felt like this was relevant to his fight, and it's like... Did, did you Uthi think Uthi say before the fight? fight? Did Ustachek say before the fight that, you know what, I don't think this dude, I think this dude is quick if you push him. Did he ever say he okay, was going to quit? Exactly, we don't know. So I can't, I can't judge that shit off what I don't know or fucking ifs. I can't do that. But I can do it off what I did see. That was bitch shit. Three punches after the bell. Three. And did the uncle at any time ever warn him, the ref, and say, hey, ref, that's the third time he hit him. Yeah, the second the, time, first that's time. That's, that's my thing. Uh, let, me get, let me get in this. Um, like I said, if he was really about that, he would have went to the referee to give like a warning shot. Basically say, hey, he's doing this the first time. He's doing this the second time. You do this or I'm going to handle it. And then you step to him after the fight. If he was, if he was, if he was really that set off and that heated, um, I could understand then. But he didn't do none of that before. But then, as I said earlier, he walked over there like everything was reasonably all to the good. He was having an issue uh, with the uh, other trainer and not the fighter. And then just boom, 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 just boom, boom. Those two shots out of nowhere. Where was the Where was the exchange with the fighters? Like point. I needed to see something like you pointing at the finger, you pointing the finger at the fighter and saying this, this, and this. I needed to see something during the fight that was like, hey, I'm seeing the warning shot here. And it, but my brother I'm talking mind, about here. In his mind, did his fighter get a warning shot? 
That's I mean, he's not right. He's going to be punished. But in his mind, did his fighter get a warning shot? He did those three times. They did. To me, in his mind, he really wasn't about that. He just decided to say, well, I'm going to get him eventually. But I'm just going to wait till everything calms down. And I think I could just get away with it. No, nah, they don't get away with it. They don't get away with it. It's not like it's like gaining fake street points. Exactly. When you're thinking, oh, I'm doing this, rah, rah, when everybody knows the shit goes down when it goes down, not when it dies off. I can and I can understand your argument about the family thing. And to a certain point, I agree with you. But it's the way he went about it that was weak. The way yeah. he went about maybe, it. Maybe in his mind, he's saying. Maybe in his mind, he's saying, if I go over here and talk to this trainer. And he got one wrong thing to say. I'm gonna show it how it feel on his fighter. Maybe but no, he's saying you that. You do that though. No. But no, I'm telling you, when, the, that the, point. Like, I get that. I get that. It, it ain't about what do you do and what don't you do. It's about what happened. It happened. I know what I know what I would have done. Put but, it this hey. way: you talk about you talk about after the three, after the three. I had more respect for the way Roger Mayweather went at Judah. It's true. When Judah hit Floyd. With that low blow and all, all the hell raised in that fight, I had more respect for what uh, Roger did in that incident, in the chaos that ensued, than what I just saw from Leon Law. Well, he didn't That's get to touch me. nothing. He didn't get to touch nothing. He basically t rushed the ring and security referee. The way Lawson did it was a silent assassin. Like he got close to the target. He did some some army type stuff. He he got in there, smooth, cool, boom, blew the place up. No. But, given, but given, but given, but given, but given what Andre has went through before, that would have been even more incentive to, to uh, jump at the cuff and say, "This is not going to be allowed." Right. Second of all, you can't be really sneaking when you're already part of the crew that's allowed to be in the ring. That's already been allowed being ringside. Like, if you want to be sneaky, yeah, Anthony Darrell would have been kind of sneaky if he found a way to get inside without the commission blocking him being heated. That's sneaky. Not a guy that's already ringside, that guy that has the credentials and saying, now nah, you're a corner, man. You're already supposed to be in the ring after the fight anyway. I think that combo with that trainer set him out because it didn't look peaceful. It looked like they had each other explaining harshly. And like he didn't, he, I feel like he really went over there. Like if this trainer say something I don't want to hear, I'm, I'm clocking something. And I think that's what he done. That that that's I mean I analyze as much as I can. I don't think he went over there with the ten. Like I'm gonna play it cool, congratulate everybody, and bam. Now nah, he went over there talking. He didn't like it, and he let that job have it, man. I, the the whole situation. Boxers got to police themselves. Cornerman got to police themselves. You don't do right, man. You can't tell everybody else how to act towards you. You can, you know, whatever happens to him, gonna happen to him. But I see what he did it for. Uh. Let's well, we're just gonna have to disagree with that, and and, and it's all good. Um, at the end, yeah, things got heated here. Uh, with Bo, with Scorsese, with myself, with Daniel, with Gail, but you know, we're gonna keep it moving anyway. Um, we're gonna be good, in, um, even at the end of this, so it's it is what it is. Just sometimes you have to have that dis heated discussion sometimes. Keep moving on, talking about the fights. So we're going right back to you, Scorsese, because our uh, previous episodes you talked about Rancis Bartholomew, uh, one of your favorite fighters. Fought Kill Relic in a limited bout. Um, he decision. I thought Relic. Now, I wish uh, uh, Gus was here because he felt that uh, Relic was going to win this bout uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Bartholomew. Even if you, even if you thought that Bartholomew got the decision, Scorsese, um, there's no way he should have got the decision by that wide margin on the judges' scorecard. Um, and we were talking about this before the show. Bartholomew, I know he's one of your favorite guys, but um, I need some explanation here because I don't know what kind of fight he was putting on uh, Saturday right, night. Right. It made no sense. No kind of no kind of Homer stuff going on here. I do like that fighter. Uh, he's challenged himself, moved up in divisions. All, all those reasons I won't get into why I like him. But that makes me harder on him as a fan of him. So when I'm watching that fight and I'm live tweeting, I'm pissed that I've seen what I've seen for the last two or three times, and that's him deciding to go. He fought Mickey Bay, no boxing, fighting. He fought Shafikov, no boxing, fighting. He fought uh, Relic, no boxing, fighting. What happened to the guy who moved up to 140 
and boxed all night from one third straight from one thirty to one forty, boxed all night. And what he's saying is, I give the explanation on why he's saying this and why I don't agree with it. If I box all night, they say I'm boring. But if I stand toe to toe, you criticize me. First of all, you worry about what your real fans say. Some people ain't never going to be your fans. When is most important? Secondly, I've heard nobody say that about you. They've said it about Rigandow, Lara, but they haven't said it about you because you are a little more exciting than them when you do box. Now, thirdly, that shit ain't paying off for you. You wasn't Shafik off a main event? Now you on the opening bout in, in Maryland? Are you from Maryland? Do you live in Maryland? Are you trying to build a base in Maryland? Ain't going to happen. It ain't paying off. People ain't come because your fight of the year style fight with Shafikov. Cut the shit out. That's what, and then he said, I'm going back to myself the next fight. Okay, cool. Now I'll get to the fight. I, the night of the fight, I'm scoring off. I'm mad at Rancis. I'm like the hell with this dude. He's pissing me off. If Relic goes in there and works, I give him the round. I go back. I watch the fight the real way, and I, I'm I'm be honest with you. I don't think every judge can have no 116, but I can see where no, where a judge with a keen eye says, "Yo, that body shot hurt him. It shook him up." Like round nine, I'm pretty sure everybody gave that to Relic, but. If you go to about 50 seconds in that round, Rancis throws a mean left to the body. Relic tries to counter with two shots. He's so hurt, he falls off balance, falls into the ropes, and he's keeping that elbow locked, and Rancis just tearing away at him. He's hurt. And for Rancis to have a knockdown and say, wow, that kept you up, and I kind of didn't agree with it, but I kind of said, okay. I said, but what about that one? That that possibly could have been the same thing. This dude was visibly hurt from a body shot. Now, it's going to take a keen ref to see that, so I could see what a what a person who ain't looking as hard can just say relic because this Rancis guy's not jabbing, but when he did jab, it worked. When he did let go of the power head shots from range, they worked. The problem but is relic, he, didn't, he didn't do it. Yeah, exactly, he let relic exactly. outwork him. Exactly, and he was depending on one shot, and sometimes that came through in rounds. Personally, I could see the fight either way closely. And I could see one person's one one judge maybe saying, "Yeah, I saw it. Why? Because I seen um, what's his name, S N Boxing on Twitter said I had it wide for Rancis, and I respect his um, I can't, I think it's Adam Abramwitz. I respect his scores. I really never see much bias out of him. He said he had it right wide for Rancis on one of my threads, and I'm like, I didn't see that tonight. So I went back and watched, and it, there are keen moments, and I mean, uh, specific moments in the fight where I said. Okay, I'm mad at Rancis for that body work all night, but it's working. It's working, and I wasn't respecting it because I wanted to see him boxing this opponent. And and I think a lot of people probably had that perception because it's like, why is he not boxing? He's the boxer. But if he want, he might be right, but people don't say that about him. Nobody's called him boring. But when you do elect to brawl, and you got hurt a few times, so that that also puts the perception that you shouldn't be fighting with this man. He almost knocked your ass out. So you should have been boxing him, but to his credit, he got back in the pocket. He got back in there and, and you know, that damn high guard and putting his head down, that made it easy on Relic. Relic put his jab jab up as well, but a lot of time Relic throws punches and he puts nothing behind them. Sometimes he's straight up square and he's throwing a shoulder punch, basically. Elbows, he's doing that. He's throwing from the shoulder and elbow. And he's not twisting and talking his punches. I, I was thinking during the fight, I said, if I put a sledgehammer in one man's hand and the other man's hand, who's going to do the most damage with that hammer on the wall? And I said, definitely not really, because he's basically just sticking his punches out sometimes. But when he did talk him up, he got respect on those punches. It, it's just, it's a close fight. The WBA, I don't know if they're doing the right thing by making each man rematch i feel like you could keep relic at two or three and let the let the winner go on and give him his shot later but they making an immediate rematch and i think it's something to do with that end dime uh fight and they just looking at both and saying forget it two close fights both y'all doing it again but uh he need he need to um go back to boxing somebody at 140 be done hurt him that's all i see uh let's move on uh kind of low-key bout underneath all the stuff that's happened Saturday night that didn't get much talk. And I'll go to your next one, Gail. David Benavidez fighting uh, Porky Medina. Um, eliminated bout. Uh, the winner is supposed to get a title shot later on um, this year. Uh, um, 
and I finally got to watch the full fight. Uh, Gail, for me, I watched David 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 Benavidez, excuse me, only twenty years old, but to me, um, what I saw in Felix Trinidad when he beat Blocker for the title, um, he destroyed Garcia in his first defense. That's what I'm seeing out of this guy. I see a guy who's a younger, who's the same age as Trinidad, Trinidad when he won a title, except he's a super middleweight, not a welterweight. Yeah, and he's a super middleweight who easily, a little bit later in his career, is going to become an absolutely devastating light heavyweight if he keeps going the way he is. He is talented, smart, fast, powerful, and put on quite an impressive performance. Um, you know, under the radar because it was such a busy fight weekend. He was fighting in that hot boxing town of Laredo, Texas. <laughs> but hey, it was man, a home, fight home, well home worth it. Home to Orlando Oh, to that's right. Saturday, that's right. Great. Oh, hey, and the fans, lucky fans who got to see it, enjoyed the hell out of it. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Uh, really a fun fight to watch. Uh, Reminder that Rogelio, a.k.a. Porky Medina, um, pretty much got robbed of a victory against James DeGale uh, when he fought DeGale here in that little de facto uh, tournament that uh, we saw here a year or two ago. Um, and Medina came in, he's, he's got the a chin of granite is an understatement. That man can take a hit. It just nothing slows him down but Benavides just kept dishing it out dishing it out doing it the right way he'd go back to the body you know to, to just to try to get a little steam off Medina and there were points he was launching so many punches you really did forget what weight class you were watching with these two guys and eventually you know, after just a blistering pace from both of them, um, Benavides prevailed after eight rounds. Really a good performance, and you just you had to keep reminding yourself of certain things. Super middleweights, not a small weight division, as it appeared from the speed and the in the volume of punches. And second, let's say it again. You said it. I said it. We're going to make it three. He's twenty years old. Twenty years old. And I'll tell you, watching this fight, I could also see what he had learned acting as Gennady Golovkin's sparring partner. He helped prepare Golovkin for the Jacobs fight. So he was playing Daniel Jacobs. But what he's picked up from Golovkin is that left hook to the body. And boy, you can see the way he delivers it. It was very pretty. And David Benavides is a star in the making. He's out of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, just a good, good performance. It's just such a shame he didn't have a little more of a showcase. You know, just bad luck that he was fighting on what was just a heavy-duty fight weekend. And you just knew he'd kind of get the short end of the attention stick, and he did. But everybody listening, put that name down. You see David Benavides you know, back on a card, you make your plans to be there to watch him. You're going to um, love him. Indeed, indeed. And, um, look, I saw Zerto Ramirez in his last fight. Uh, what I saw from Benavidez, um, Benavidez, Benavidez has a good shot to beat Zerto Ramirez, who we saw in his last outing. Uh, he would outwork him. Um, that's a fight I want to see in six months to a year from now. Yeah, but you and I both know Bob Arum is not letting Zordo get anywhere near David Benavides. Not, not right now. And, you know, if Aaron plays it right, Benavides, you know, moves up past Zordo. Because David's a really tall, rangy, super middleweight, and that's because of his youth. You know, once he gets to be in his mid-20s or so, he's going to – I bet he'll move up. And at that point, he – probably will be looking for more significant opposition. Um, you know, I think he gets in there against James DeGale. He's got every reason to believe he can beat De DeGale, especially after the last few fights we've seen with DeGale. Indeed, indeed. I'm going, I'm going overseas. We went overseas with Leon Walsh and um, um, Javante Davis. Uh, going back overseas to Japan, to Japan specifically. Um, Started with you, Bo. I don't know if you saw this bout in the Oya Anui. 
fighting uh, Ricardo Rodriguez, stopped him in three. Um, for me, see, the more I see, um, anyway, excuse me, anyway, uh, the better he gets. And I'm going to say it right now, um, Bo. If anyway fights Roman Gonzalez, he beats him. He beats him. <laughs> and dare I say, not only does he beat him, with that power, he may stop him. Am I going too far? No, uh-uh, not at all. <clears throat> I remember a while back, I thought, I think it was 2014. I think it, I think it might have been 2014 or 2015. I thought no, no way he should have been the fighter of the year because that's when he was fighting, um, going up in weight division, fighting champions, and and the guys he had beaten, in Adrian Hernandez and Omar Nevarez were quality guys making string of tighter defenses. They were linear champions of the division. But I said a while back, I said if Roman Gonzalez is planning on fighting a new Inoue, he needs to fight him now. This was back in. 2015, uh, middle 2015 to late 2015, I said, if he's going to fight Noe Noe, he needs to fight him now while he's still kind of green and hasn't learned anything. Because if he fights him later, he's going to be a problem. Well, problem. Problem. Because what, what you're talking about, what we saw in Noe Noe is, granted, people can say, oh, yeah, but look at the type, type of opposition. That That is correct. But we still can't take away what we saw with our eyes, which is, we saw him give you another dimension of his fighting ability. He moved a lot more than I see. Normally, he would stand there and do the high guard thing. No, he actually was taking that half-step pivot, doing that half-inch lean back. He did a lot more moving. He showed me he, he, he would, showed some counters. He and showed he continuous. Right. He and, and, then, and, then, and then he showed where he wasn't just looking to throw one or two big shots. He was doing actual combinations from head, body, body, head. So he showed me a different dimension. I haven't seen that from Roman Gonzalez. Roman Gonzalez fights one way, and he's fought one way all the time. He's, he comes at you, he presses you, he tries to outwork you. But here's the problem is when you're going in there with a guy who can punch, a guy that has the ability to neutralize what you can do, you have to have another dimension to confuse this guy. I haven't seen that from him. I've seen what I saw last night was now in a way, regardless of level of competition, the fact that he was able to show it to me and look effective doing it was the impressive part about it. So it's an interesting fight. Supposedly that fight's going to be HBO is looking to make that fight. Uh, I don't know how that's going to go because I know before uh, Gonzalez he wants his, his rematch, but he also uh, was he had complaints about hey you guys if you want me to fight these dudes you got to pay me. So it depends on where HBO is willing to shell out for that. But um, I'm still under the impression that. They're trying to make a super fight between him and Yamanaka, which would be a, a, a big fight. But if, if he fights, Roman Gonzalez fights Anoe right now, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm with you. I think he stops this guy. I think he stops him because the last opponent was able to knock him down and hurt him a couple of times. Well, Inoue punches way harder than the last guy Roman Gonzalez fight. And he's better from, from a skill set level. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not far-fetched. And I, and, and I would urge folks who are listening to us now, we'll be listening to the podcast when it's up on iTunes and SoundCloud uh, uh, tomorrow to please uh, find his bout, um, Anui's last bout on, on YouTube. It's up all over YouTube now uh, to, to really witness what Bo was talking about, how Anui, anyway, uh, did so much. Um, he shocked me the way he went southpaw and was effective with the jab and with the straight left. It looked like it was just a regular thing with him. And I've never seen him do that before, but yeah, he just brought it out of the blue. Uh, just speaks to what a talent he is, and, and he's just peeling off layers, peeling off layers the more and more you see him. And again, as I said earlier, uh, in every fight, uh, he's getting stronger physically. Um, you see the power, you see the speed, uh, and, and from the skill, skill set, he's just like a cocoon just opening up. And you, yeah, um, Roman, Roman, everybody. Considers him was considering him number one pound for pound before he lost to uh, uh, Sister Crot. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that's because people have not seen this uh, Japanese uh, dynamo fight. I want to stay over in Japan. Um, I don't know if anyone saw this, if everyone saw this fight, um, Hassan Abdam fighting uh, Murata. 
I'm gonna open up a little bit for anybody who wants to talk about it. Anui was the good. Terrence Crawford was the good. Javante Davis was the good. Uh, the derail fiasco and all that thing, all that ensued that after that bout, that was the ugly. For me, I consider this decision the, the bad. I mean, I know um, your boys over at the movement, uh, they disagree with me. They had Indom winning. Most others had Murata winning. I'm just going to try to open this up for everybody who saw the bout. If so, uh, uh, your thoughts on the bout. I, uh, Murata knocked Indom down, I want to say 11. I forgot which 11, 9, I forgot which round. But for me, he controlled the action throughout. And Dom didn't do much of anything. And I just felt he won it. I had um, Murata winning by five points. Uh, so anybody who wants to comment, please, your thoughts on this bout. What else All, right, all, <laughs> all right. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, you can't say it was home cooking because you had American officials, um, an American referee, but it, it just was really a head scratcher. It was clear that Murata won the fight. It, it appeared clear he won the fight. And, you know, had it been really close on the cards, okay, you know, I mean, sometimes you do see these, you know, really narrow differences of opinion, okay, but this was not close, not at all. The cards, you know, uh, it was, I mean, Bob Arum called it a worse decision than Pacquiao Bradley won. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, I, you know, for once, Arum wasn't hyping. You know, it really was pretty much that bad. I mean, you know, the third one of the judges had the had Murata up one seventeen to one ten. That that was way out of line. But then you had the other judges see it at one sixteen, one twelve, and one fifteen, one thirteen. I I don't know. It, it was just it was crazy. It was just a it was just the strangest fight. The WBA president has called for a rematch. You know, I'm not sure it's an interesting he enough fight to bother. He I mean, for he match. He apologized to Barada uh, Camp. Yeah, he apologized yeah. to the people in the in all of Japan. He's apologized to everyone. Yeah. Like, like, well, and and you know, in a boxing crazy country like Japan, you know, most of their you know world stage competitors are in the smaller weight divisions. You know, Barada is one of the few in one of the bigger divisions and you know so he really stands out on the japanese boxing scene as a middleweight you know he he's he's just got a lot higher level of notoriety i mean he's he's one of the, that nation's heavyweights if you will really the way they look at it so i mean that made it even worse and it, but the problem is do you really want to see a rematch i just I don't think I do. I feel bad for him. I do think he got robbed, but I think you just say, whatever, it's boxing, and you move on. You just move on with the knowledge well, in your heart that you won that fight, and your fans know it, and they're good with you. Uh, before everybody else comments, before everybody else comments, um, I see EJ Boxing Live has joined us. Um, yeah. I'm going to give him a, a, a quick second, a quick moment here. I'm going I'm to backtrack a bit. Um, you were, EJ, you were at the uh, uh, Davis, uh, Leon Walsh bout. You was at the weigh-in, um, at, uh, at the press stuff during the week. Uh, yeah. Give a report from your end, um, from your vantage point, uh, about not just the fight itself, but the whole week, uh, how Davis handled the situation. Mayweather, who was also in the building, he had a little press thing with uh, uh, Anthony Joshua the day after. Uh, your report. I actually went to the fight, actually, as well. Like, I actually... Went to the yeah, yeah, with the, yeah, I'll send you went to the flight. Yeah, you was in the building, so yeah, I covered. I did. Yeah, I covered the whole week. Um, and um, you know, they they um, actually, I didn't go to the I didn't go to the media workout, but I went into the press conference, and it was just a normal press conference, and then all of a sudden, Mayweather just turned up, man, and I, I just said it like I think really and truly, I think he needed to because I didn't think the, the gate was doing that well, and um, you know, Frank Warren just set back and let Mayweather do what Mayweather does. And it caused the trouble with the little washers. I got like loads of videos of the Walsh brothers saying, 
Mayor never did this, Mayor never did that. But Mayor will talk. Oh, I'll tell you what, Mayor will's jab is as quick as his mouth. There's way more way, way can hit you with his jab, his mouth, because Mayor will just put it to him. He goes, Well, when have you been to America? Okay, then. And it was just funny. It was just humor. It was it was good to see that side of him. Because I think John John T. Davis, he still hasn't come out of his shell. You know what I'm saying? So you can't need Mayor to push that. And like everyone, you know, looks at you and Dave, it's like more like Danny Garcia. And Angel, you know what I'm saying? Danny, you know, don't really say too much. Angel to the big mouth. And Mayor and John, they, they kind of work together, like big brother, little brother kind of thing. And, and um, the washes, you know, it, it was good. I mean, that you could push that narrative and sell him the fight. And you, you know what? To be fair, Andy Yard was on the card. And like a lot of people were impressed by him. And I talked to uh, Chris Hobbs. He was the guy who had the belt and stuff like that. He actually it was a good performance by Andy Yard. So he's one to watch out. I think the overall in the card, I think he saved that Mayweather, you know, unluckily got, you know, they threw drinks at Mayweather when he was leaving the arena. <laughs> I caught one in the fan, but that's because Mayweather wild the fans up so good that they wanted to do something to Mayweather. But I think overall the card was good. And, and, the, and the UK fans want to see Mayweather and John T. Davis and the Andy Joshua and the Mayweather the day kind of, I think it was like two days after. Um, that was really good for the UK fans as well over here. Um, you know, just taking pictures, talking, him and Mayor were going backwards and forth. Mayor was saying he'll be the under he wants to be on the undercard of him and Conor McGregor. I don't think Eddie Hearn would let that. You're the heavyweight champion of the world. And um, I actually got into arguing with Nezel on the boxing west earlier on today actually about that. It's like yeah. Andy, he's the heavyweight champion of the world. How you gonna be on the undercard of of, of, a, of a, a not even a boxing fight? Come on, man. Like Joshua yeah, that's, a, that's a step down. That's called a step down. You don't do yeah, that. Yeah, but I think Joshua Joshua says stuff like that. Because he's just a cool dude, but you know the powers that be, we couldn't. No, 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 no. Joshua, Joshua is the cash cow. The Uno, Uno. You know, Mary used to say that hunch though. You know, what I'm saying how Mary used to talk about number one. That's who Joshua is. Yeah, he he has the potential to be Mayweather, like in terms of money, and he could he really become a, more of a worldwide popular figure than Mayweather. Yeah, he, you, over you know, here, over he, here, he over here. do that. Yeah, over here, he's already over here. He's already. He's already reached them stages, just beating Klitschko, you know what I mean? And the rematch, apparently that's going to happen. So the the fight, the fight card was really good. You were talking about um, the Marat fight against them. Now, that was that would have been a good fight. It was another day, you know what I mean? It would have been a good fight on a day. But unfortunately, it came on a day when it was hectic. You know, Crawford over there, just, I, I got him arguably number one, pound for pound. I, I, I know people, they disagree on Jay Ward. For me, right now, Terence Crawford, Terence Bud Crawford is number one pound for pound. I know people say Lomachenko. Over, over, over I, HBO's pick of Loma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I Just for me. The, I, the, everyone could, you know, like the pound for is subjective. You, you like, I just like the body of work, the way he goes about it, the better opponents. And then even though like Lomachenko, Sota, Waters, you know, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. But the body of work, he was, uh, I got, man, he's just... That guy was a hard fight. That's a hard opponent. He made him look easy. He made it look easy. So, um, and it was a it was a great fight weekend. You had to keep switching channels, find where you're going. And uh, this week, man down. And I'm the only probably I'm probably the only guy in the UK. And then with me, Michael, we've been arguing about back and forth with Kelbrook, yeah. But man down, man down. That's what I'm going with. I'm going Errol Spence. The truth. The question is: Is Errol really the truth, or is Kel the special one? We will find out. But basically, it. That's another one. I know you ain't you ain't got to that point right now, but boxing is flying. I mean, who could think it doesn't a short strip? You had Clisco Joshua, Crawford, you had Javante Davis, you had uh, all the other fight other little fights were like Marat and all the other fights there. Now you over here, you got Errol Spence and thing. Like it is crazy. Like we are in a great time of boxing and like it's just it's just great. It's just happening. Talking about the uh, the, the anyway fight against thing, I kind of disagree. With the inner way versus Chocolate. I'll tell you why. This this war, I can't, I know he's coming off an injury and he, he beat the opponents, but he's basically been fighting in Japan. Now, everyone and Chocolate was just devastating in Japan. When he came over to the States, he's, I don't know, it's something different. I don't know what it was, if it's different, but the big occasion, whatever. But his performances over in the States have been okay, right? And against that, we knew that Thailand guy was going to give him trade. Anyone knew anything about boxing? Thailand guy can punch. Yeah, I agree. In a way, can can punch. But until anyway, fights in the states has a couple of fights in the states to see how he looks fighting out of Japan. Then with him, because a lot of guys look really good in their hometown. I'll give you Lucian Butte. He was nice in Canada. Ooh, when he came out, 
hey, not so. When he fights in America, not so. But in Canada, he was the man, right? So is in a way, has he got? Has he gonna? How's he gonna deal with fighting somewhere else where it's not Japan, where you got everything you're calling for? So we have to find out about that. But for well, me, yeah. right now, I, I, for me right now, I, if, if he fought Chocolito right now, I understand what Chocolito's got, but Chocolito's body of work of the guys he's been facing right now, just the last two, just the last two opponents. I'll go with Chocolito because of the because of the last two opponents. And they will. I know he was supposed to be both of them, right? But if even if anyway went against the same two opponents, how would anyway look? Would anyway stop them? How would that fare? So I just go with Chocolito right now. Pound for pound, I, I go. Tell you with yeah. I'll tell you this, he'll beat Quadras easier than Roman did. Uh I I don't know. Especially given up especially. He ain't gonna stay there. I tell you what, he he, he I tell you what he may do, he may do, but I don't think he gonna like you gotta remember, like uh, Navarra and them other guys, they flat through it. Like the like, thing ain't moving now, he's moving now. He ain't gonna stand there, let you hear man. And and the, the little Thailand guy, he he can touch as 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 in a way face the guy who hits just as hard as him. I don't think so. I don't know. Omar uh, can punch. But I don't know if he's faced a guy with just as much as power as he has, and how's he gonna deal with when he gets touched up by a guy with power? You know what I'm saying? So Chuck but, Leo, that's yeah, what you're I'm right. Saying. Yeah, you're yeah. right. But the other side of that, in a way, would give him a lot more movement than Roman did. Roman was right there. <laughs> the thing is, this is what I'm saying. We have to see, uh, in a way, in the states, fight in the states, away from home comforts, home eating. You know what I'm saying? In, in the states, we're easy gonna because it does make a difference. The same Errol Spence coming over in the UK like Burns did, like Bradley did, and so many other guys coming out your comfort zone, going away for your heart, going away from what you know is comfort and doing the job. So it depends on who, who he's facing for the first time. So I like to say that, but I understand why you guys on the eye test and just why what we what we've been what you guys have been talking about anyway for the last two, three years. Yes, I agree with you, but I'm gonna have to go with the guy who fought these two guys here. They're tough guys, you know. The, the quadras and and you know Russell Russell whatever you know what I'm saying yeah he, the Thailand guy them two guys are tough man so if I I love to, if anyway wants to make a statement take out them two guys and then maybe go for the Chocolito fight I would love to see that like wouldn't you like to see that how it's like when Pacquiao with the Mayo fight the contrast you know what I'm saying when Mayo was there what Pac uh, for uh, Hatton you now Mayo took a while before he stopped him and then Pacquiao blew him up. And you know what I'm saying? So, so that you know, that's what that's what I like to see. But I understand where you guys are coming from. Not to disagree with you too much, but I just feel like, say, I always go by the body of work. But anyway, I, like I said, man down, no chop, no hashtag chocolate brownies tonight. He's got too many problems. Stabbed in his leg, weight problems, been stopped for the first time. Nah, man, I'm going with I'm going with man down. I'm going with Texas, Lone State, the Lone State Warriors. So. Yeah, uh, fair, fair enough, fair enough on on, on a proposal, Nui, um, uh, Roman got about um, EJ trying to do, uh, kind of jump at the gun here. We hadn't talked about Brooke yet, but we'll get to it. Uh, uh, let's open. I'm, I'm open up the discussion right quick. Talk about uh, once again. Talk about um, Indom's win over Murata again. As I stated earlier, I felt that uh, Murata won and won rather comfortably. He didn't get the decision. Anybody who else who wants to comment, please do. I kind of agree with Gail in the sense of why should we see a rematch, but I understand it. It's one of those things where you kind of owe it to Murata to hopefully have judges that actually watch the fight, <laughs> score it. And interestingly enough, it's true. When it comes to Japan, everybody's in lower weight classes. Murata's one of the rare cases, I forgot the guy's name, but it's a heavyweight prospect. He's ranked, I think, in the top 15 of almost every sanctioning body in Japan. They have a heavyweight, too, but that's pretty much it. It's that heavyweight. And then there's Marauders that are far as guys that are on the horizon in weight classes that are 135 and below or above. Everything else, yeah, it's going to be the new ways, the Yamanakas, the Tanakas. So that's that's going to be an interesting rematch because it has to happen. Like This was a fight that was so bad. The decision was so bad. We literally hounded Gilberto Mendoza on social media. Like I said, he apologized to everybody that he could on social media. 
and he finally had to apologize again for not so much the score about Thelamy, but the mere fact that you had a ton of limiter fight and two, you had to combine probably 30 or 35 fights experience from all three judges. Mm, We're going to see it. Indeed, indeed. Uh, I'll just rematch, rematch, rematch. I'm with Gail here. Um, it probably will happen, but I just don't know if I want to see it because I just expect the same results uh, because of uh, basically because of Endom and who he is. Um, Chenny, um, he didn't throw enough punches. I just expect the same thing um, if they were to fight again. Um, again, I'm just not <laughs> interested to that. Um, I think Murata won. Um, I think it was a con- not quite an outright robbery, but uh, yeah, putting in hell should be raised, and I can understand Mendoza basically apologizing to everybody named Mommy in the aftermath of the bout. Two final bouts here that took place in Japan. Um, Diego Higa uh, scored a sensational six round, six round stoppage over um, Juan Hernandez. Um, Kosai Tanaka defeated Angel Acosta by decision. Uh, really good matchup. Gus and I talked about it a lot. Again, I'm just going to open it up for here. Everyone here, EJ, I know you cover Japan boxing. I think you do too as well, Bo. If you saw any of these bouts, Higa's win, only 21, uh, defeating the uh, veteran Hernandez or Tanaka. Again, I think he's only in his early 20s, uh, defeating Acosta for anybody who saw the bout. Please comment. Anyone? I guess no one. So what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll just make a little comment myself. He got 21 years old, um, orthodox fighter, um, pressure fighter who looks to take your head off against a Hernandez who beat the uh, won the title just a couple of months back over in Thailand in a bit of an upset, in my opinion. Um, he got came on the front foot. He looked sort of similar to Roman Gonzalez. Uh, straw weight days, especially when um, Roman won the title. I'm um, on the come up. Um, applied the pressure was in his face all night long, and and the guy can really punch. Um, Hernandez got some good shots in, but um, Higa took the punch as well. But he was just in his face, in his face, like white on rice. Finally struck. We started hitting him more in round four and five, but in the sixth round. He basically blitzed him, knocked him down three times with single shots. And I think you can see a potential star here um, at the flyweight division. Tanaka, uh, former champion at strawweight, has moved up to win a belt at uh, 108, fighting Acosta, number one guy from Puerto Rico, I believe. Um, what was thought to be a tough fight for Tanaka was kind of easy. Um, I believe Tanaka scored a knockdown in round five. Tanaka is one of these... Japan is hot right now in terms of a lot of weight fighters. You see a lot of really good fighters on the come up who are all young. Um, Tanaka, I believe, knocked them down in round five, controlled the bout throughout, uh, set the pace early. Um, he is improving a lot using all around foot movement. Um, I thought he was limited when I saw him at 108. He's getting better and better and better. He's using his jab better. He goes more to the head and body, more consistent, uh, better footwork. And- yeah, um, Tanaka right now is the best at 108. Um, it was an argument. I know Nauta was arguing that uh, uh, Higa right now is the best at 105, 112. It would make him a favorite over uh, Donnie Niete. So, yeah, there you go. Um, I see your, mount, your mic is unmuted. EJ, you want to say something? Oh, yeah. So, you t- are you talking about uh, some new hot Japanese fighter? Yeah, I'm talking about the Higa win over um, Juan Hernandez and um, Tanaka's win over Acosta. No, no, no. You got me on that one. My bad. My mic should be muted. <laughs> <laughs> and I was opening, yeah, I was asking and nobody didn't say anything, so I just decided nah, to take nah, it. Nah, anybody nah. Wants to? You was that. You see this what I'm saying, Mike? There were so many fights that weekend, boy, but Mike's, like, Mike, you hardcore, bro. You hardcore. You got that one? That was on the same, that was on the same weekend, like, last weekend? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I got to catch you. I yeah. got to up, man. Good job, Mike. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and actually, even, uh, both of those bouts um, on YouTube, Diego Higa, D-I-A, D-A-I-G-O, Higa, H-I-G-A. 
Uh, he defeated the Hernandez who beat the uh, Hernandez who beat the Tie Fighter Do and I liked a lot. So you know what? Hey, you know what? Fee was in that car. What's his game? Agashi. Agashi got bar. He got beat down in it. Agashi lost in it. Yeah. Then. Yeah, that was the most surprising. Yeah, that's thing the you see that, that I didn't see that once because when I see Gashi get beat down, I knew he was gonna get he was struggling with the weight, man. Remember, he was at flyweight and he went down to light fly, you know, and he struggled. He got beat down pretty bad, man. So I did catch that one, but the other two, nah, you got me on that, bro. You, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, you know, and I would say you may want to do a commentary on both. Oh, of those yeah, oh okay. <laughs> commentary, especially he goes when he looked like a little dynamo. Um, he comes in to take your head off. Um, I, I think you'll really be impressed by him. I'll bring you, yeah, I'll do that. Like me, you and now we do. We, we, me, you and now and that, so you can kind of fill in the blanks when I'm when I'm doing nothing. We can offer me, you and now. That'll be good. I'll do that. Yeah, okay, and I don't think anybody else has saw any of those two bouts. Um, I, I went really nerdy there. So let's get to uh, previews. <laughs> no new stuff. Um, EJ, EJ alluded to this earlier during his talk. Uh, Kell Brook, Kell Brook, Errol Spence going down in Sheffield this Saturday. Uh, 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 highly anticipated, long awaited showdown. Uh, Brooke, the champion, spent his number one contender for over a year now. Uh, uh, um, since you're there in, in, in the UK, EJ, I'm gonna start off with you. Um, I know you believe in you believe that Spence will win. Yeah. Um, again, get into further detail why and and, and what's the uh coverage over in the UK and the week oh. leading to the south? Oh, the coverage is good, man. Sheffield Wednesday, um. Is Sheffield Wednesday or the winner? It's, look, they've got a soccer. It's, 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 listen, it's a stadium fight. Um, Kell Brook knows he has to win this fight. You know, he's coming off the, the loss against Trouble G. And um, listen, they're going to give it They're gonna give it to Errol Spence. They're going to let him know that he, he he's not in the States. And uh, this is a massive, massive fight. And I, I was one of the rare guys who I put money on Kell to beat Triple G. I know that a lot of guys went against me, but I just felt like. Triple G. Yeah, you, you, you got hit hard for that. Yeah, I was, yeah, you know I was in that gambling. Was, yeah, you know I was in that gambling spree. But uh, listen, I'm I'm playing it safe today, right? I'm playing, <laughs> I'm playing it safe now. Or just on form, on form. Errol Spence, like he looks like that dude. Like it's hard to go against the current. Like when you got in a way going against someone of Vial, you know what I'm saying? When Bradley came over and beat uh, Junior Witter, it's it's the you know bring the desert storm. It's hard, you know, when you know you see someone great. If Kell Brook was to win this fight, he could just retire on this man. He don't need to do nothing no more. But I just feel like say it's the perfect timing for Spence. He all you gotta do there is come in the fight, land a couple of jabs, fake to the body, like, keep hitting Kell in all the, in on the orbital bone. Even if he doesn't, Kell Brook, remember he had to come down from middleweight down. You know, he keep working the body. It's just it's just too much that Kell has to deal with. Kell saying gonna land the chocolate brownies. On, on Spence, that would be good, interesting if he can land some of the brownies, but that's, I mean, he's got a puncher's chance, so he could he could turn the fight around, but it's going to be a stoppage, uh, going mad, ninth round stoppage for uh, Spence, and, uh, you know, I get booed by a lot of the other guys from the, from the UK over here, but I've been consistent, you know, me and you might go back as a forward about Kell Brook and Deontay Wilder, but I've been consistent, I would pick Kell if I felt like stylistically he could have won, but that damage he took from Triple G, Nah, nah, and he has to come down the way. People were actually making a comparison between Roy Jones and when he lost the title. Well, I say, well, Roy Jones when he went up to heavyweight, he beat and he beat Ruiz, man. He just, he just, he just, it was just too much. Just, it was too much. Well, Kell Brook got beat at middleweight badly at Orbital Bowl. Now he's coming down to face Errol Spence. Ah, I don't like it. So it's big. It's very big. Showtime. Steve Espinosa is over here. Actually, I could have went to the presser and the way thing today um, is good is that, you know, obviously you guys are over here as well, Showtime's over here. And I think he'll get a fair shake if it goes to the cards. And I think that's most important. I think if it goes to the cards, I think uh, Errol Spence will get a fair shake. Steven Espinosa and them guys, there's too many eyes watching for this car, this to be this to, this to to be controversial. But you never know. This is boxing. It could be. And another thing as well, George Groves versus uh, Tunoff, Jimmy Tunoff. Um, I'm going against the grain again. Uh, well, kind of. I'm going. I'm going with Tunoff. I think Tunoff on form looks much better. I know he got lost against Stern, but he got robbed in Germany. I think George Groves he hasn't looked good in a couple of his performances. I think Tunoff could win. Maybe that fight could be controversial in the win. So Ooh. hands down, yeah, I'll go with Tunoff. Hands down, man down. Errol Spence. I'm going with the truth. If, let's leave you with this. We're going to find out, like Keith Furman said, if Spence is really the truth, or we're going to find out if Kel is the special one. I'll leave it as that. 
Ooh, interesting question here in the uh, uh, live chat. Uh, going back to the discussion we had about Anui, question is from Jacob, uh, and I want everybody's uh, thoughts on this or anybody who knows. The question was, is um, Anui versus Tete, who do you got? Oh, oh. And for those who've seen Tete, uh, please unmute your mics. I want everybody's thoughts on this. Oh, that's Tete a, has that that's... height. Tete has height. Tete has and for reach. those who don't know, Zelani Tete, uh, re who just captured the WBO Bantamweight Championship, um, I've been talking about him for a couple of years now. And I've also said or put on the record if he fought Roman, he would beat him. It probably stop him. But yeah, the question is right now, before we go back to uh, Brooke Spence, I want this question answered. Um, Naoya, in a way, Zelante Tete, who you got? Tete. Tete. I have to lean Tete, yeah. I have to lean I, Tete. How are you getting past them big bloody, you know what I'm saying? You ain't getting past, and even if you're getting, he's going to tie you up, man. Like, he ain't going to, that's a puzzle. That's a Rubik's Cube. Like, I'm going go with Tete. The eye test will say Tete, but if, if he can get in and hurt, hurt thing, then boy, like, but I don't see him getting in. So I'm going with Tete. That's just me. Bo, Bo, Gail, Scorsese, your thoughts? Boy, I have to lean to Anui. I just think he's got some more tools if they're matched up. I mean, if it's it's if a if it's a flat out <laughs> brawl, it's really really messy. I think it goes to Tete, but I don't think it would be, and I think Anui pulls it out. But I I do think it's a razor's edge difference and a great fight. Bo. First, I want to say, whoever thought of that question, congratulations. Jacob, that's Jacob, the, regular on the show, he couldn't make that's it. That's our him. man, Jacob. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. congratulations. That's, 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 wow. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, that's boxing king nerd status right there. Man, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, was he sitting at home going through his Rolodex of measuring height, weight, distance? Oh, this would be good for the ask the panel. Like, that's like so fucked up to do, Jacob. But, uh. <laughs> Evil genius. But, um, I, you know what? Who I know everybody's going with Zelani Tete. Here's the thing, and remember, I talk about dimensions. I haven't seen enough from Zelani Tete. Zelani Tete is always dependent on his height. He's always dependent on his reach and being the bigger man. What happened when he's in there with somebody that can negate that? And I think he, no way, from what I saw, has the skill set to possibly do that. What happens when I, I just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to go with with Anui in this one, but. I'm gonna and I'm gonna put an asterisk there. If Tay Tay can stay focused or it turns into a brawl, then I give it to Tay Tay. But for right now, I gotta go with Anoy. Uh Scorsese. If you I don't know about either one of them, but I wanna see somebody fight that 118 uh Rashi Warren guy got beat up by. That's who I want to see him get in. That dude be fighting. If you can't fight, you ain't beating him, period. Can't remember Tete the name. ZZ of... Top. ZZ Top. That's no, the name. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about. Um... Get in there with him. I don't Get in see there that. with him. That's what I want to see. Tay Tay will slow down the pace against that guy. If he does okay. that, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not giving him no credit for the, no, no win over um, an average Rashid Warren. I'll average. Keep down. Average. That was a beat down. That wasn't the win. That was a beat down. What we talk about looking mm -hmm. yeah. beat. Average. Yeah, beat, beat down of a average, exactly. average guy, average who's, guy who's, like never, who's never I, I made a K good K transition. I, I saw Tay Tay just, just basically looking at an average. I thought the guy was average, and all Tay Tay was doing was looking at him, touching him with a jab. Touch. ZZ Top was in there going forward and going and getting it. So I got to see. You know, I got to see if you can fight or not when somebody actually come to fight. Then Tete we can go from there. That guy. He was torn with that guy. It was easy work. He was yawning throughout that bout. So, and I mean, again, I ain't giving no ZZ, no, no, not no way, <laughs> average Warren. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Amateur. No. Um, in terms of the fight itself, uh, I think the opposite. I think if it's an all out brawl, I would give the win, I would give the nod to Anui. Uh, but I think if it's a fart at a slow pace, at a boxing pace, uh, if Tete is allowed to establish that jab and that length, I'm with EJ on this one. Um, as talented as Anui is, uh, it's a daunting task against that five foot nine um, condor. 
<laughs> of a bantam weight. Um, long arms and legs. Let's remember now, this guy can punch. I know he went the distance his last bout, but uh, Tay Tay can hit, and he's a better inside fighter than people let on. Um, I'm going with the new way based on not a new. Way, I'm going with uh, Tay Tay based off of the size advantage, but for me, a new way would have to sit there and 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 make this a wild affair where he could open uh, Tay Tay up and land um, within the midst of a combinations where Tay-Tay couldn't see the punches. But if Tay-Tay is able to fight and control and see everything coming from Anui, I'm rolling with, I'm rolling with the brother EJ on this one. I will have to go with Tay-Tay. Um, but yeah, let's go back to this Brooke Spence. Uh, 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 um, going back to you, going to you, Bo, and then you score Cesar. Your preview, your thoughts. Of the... Uh, uh, Brooks, Brooke and Spence uh, uh, out. You know what? <laughs> it's ironic you go to me. I have been fucking with my UK friends all week long. Posting up uh, of uh, I, I put up posts about UK fighters that was put on their ass. Uh, I put up a post of Floyd Mayweather standing over Ricky Hatton. I put up. I did a post of um, Amir Khan saying this motherfucker can't never stay on his feet. I put up a post about Lennox Lewis. So you've been, tro I'm, been trolling. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. Like a motherfucker. And I told them I do, was doing live feed videos. And it's all it's all in good fun, of course. And I, and I let them know, look, I, if, if he loses, I'm not going to run. I'll, I'll come on Saturday night. And I'll take it like a man. You know? So, but uh, I've been messing with him because here's the, here's the thing. By no shape, form, or fashion am I somebody's going to sit and say Earl Spence washes Kell Brooks. No. Uh, regardless of what you want to say, Kell Brooks is the champion. Kell Brooks has fight. Uh, he fought. He fought Sean. He did fight Sean Porter. Although however long it was, uh, long it was, he did fight and he did beat him. So we know he has some experience at that level. And uh, you know he got in there, showed some guts against Gennady Golovkin. But here's my thing with that though. This is why I'm going with with Earl Spence. I'm going with Earl Spence because there's. Three factors. There's three unknown factors that is very crucial in a fight like this. A number one, I'm not confident in his eye being completely healed. They say in sparring, he's okay, but sparring is controlled and is half paced. At 100%, when it is fast paced, fast combat action, and a dude is coming at you with 100%, not 50%, not in a control environment, not because he's getting paid not to hurt you, but give you work. It's a different. How many times have we seen athletes heal? We think they're fine, then they get out. They get out there in a the, in the game, and they retweak that injury again. Because what happens? You're doing it at you're doing it at 100. You're not doing it 50 percent anymore. You're doing it at 100. percent It is a different animal than than when you're being in a control environment, and at 50 percent versus 100 percent. So I'm not sure of that eye. Secondly, when it comes to that eye, if Earl Spence hits him in his eye and it's not right, and it tweaks a little bit. I don't know about the mental state of Kell Brook. Will it take him back to the Gennady Golovkin fight? Because when you get beat like that, that sticks in your head. And his corner. If he goes back to his corner, that's another unknown. His corner. If he goes back to the corner and say, man, my eye, I'm seeing I'm blurry vision. His corner might be too eager to stop it too soon if Earl Spence lands two, two or three good flush shots there. His corner might be like, no, 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 no. We're going to stop this. We're going to stop this because we don't want you to go blind or whatever. Then the third last unknown is the weight. He comes down in weight. And EJ said this earlier, and here's the, the argument I make with people when they say that. Well, Roy Jones did it. Here's the thing. Um, Antonio Tarver is not the body puncher that Earl Spence is, nor did, nor did he go to Roy Jones' body. Like Earl Spence is going to go to kill Brooks' body. When you maintain a particular weight, your body gets used to that weight. Your body's used to the punishment the weight's going to take, and it's able to absorb it. But when you go up and then you come down, you weakened your body. So now your body, the, your body isn't going to be able to absorb it right, and the shock from it, from those punches and blows, could affect you. Those three unknowns that I'm not sure about, that's a, if, as a, if I'm a betting man, that's enough for me to say, you know what? I got to look at Earl Spence, who is ex exceptionally hungry, who, a, a, who if you, regardless of what you say about level of competition, the, the matter of the result is he's getting guys out early, earlier than the other dudes that they face. Um, 
we've seen this before in boxing is when a guy is chasing a guy or a guy is trying to position himself, what does he do? He fight guys that other guys have fought and he beats them earlier. Like somebody mentioned Pacquiao and Hatton. Pacquiao, when he was chasing Floyd, fought dudes that Floyd fought and beat him in better fashion. That's what made people, us want to see it. So he, he, he did that. He passed the eye test. And if I look at Jojo Don and, and, and Kevin Bezier, and I'm looking at, you know, regardless of how you feel about it, uh, you know, Chris Algieri and Leonard Bundu, who was a tough dude, and how Peterson, Panamara, and Jeff Horn, and all those dudes didn't step in the ring with this guy. That's something to take note of. So that's the only reason why I'm rolling with Earl Spence. If Kel Brooks didn't have the weight issue or the eye issue, I'd have to roll with him. I'd have to go with him. But because of those three unknowns, I got Earl Spence. I think Earl Spence could probably knock him out with a body shot at that, too. Maybe late round stoppage. But by no shape, form, or fashion is this a washover. It's it's still a good fight. It's a close because Earl Spence doesn't necessarily move his head, <laughs> and you know, and what, what what happens? This is the most athletic guy Earl Spence has ever faced. You know, and Kell Brooks is very good at throwing combinations. He not a, he's not a he's, he's not a softy at all. Period. But those are the only reasons why I'm going with Earl Spence because of those three unknown factors. But I told I'm telling all my UK fans that are listening right now. If Earl Spence wins, I'm gonna give y'all. I'm not gonna mess with y'all Saturday night. I'm gonna give y'all Saturday night to cry. You know, I I I, I got some Charmin for you motherfuckers too. I'm gonna give y'all Saturday night to cry. I got some baby wipes and diapers for y'all to cry. But come Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday when I'm off work, I'm fucking with y'all hard. I'm, I'll try to listen to both commentary here, but as it's going on, they do a post game of uh, Cleveland Boston. Um, I have to say this. I, 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 didn't, I need for uh, TNT to stop showing um, pictures, photos of, of Shaq's um, alien looking monster feet, um, toes going, his, his hammer toes. I just have to say that that's rude because it's distracting me right now from talking about it right now. If y'all hadn't seen it, Shaq, oh my God. Uh, yeah, it should come with a trigger warning of Shaq's foot. Um, yeah, that's all I just have to say about that. I just had to get that off of my chest. Um, you Scorsese, Gail, uh, Daniel, uh, your breakdown, uh, your preview of um... Brooks Vince. You there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, your mic breaking up a little bit. Mike was well, chopping up, so okay. Uh, let me I'll keep talking, I'll get back on. I'll, get, right, I'll, um... get, I'll get back on. All right, um, yeah, um, I call him Kale, either held or failed Brook. That's how I look at him. I don't think there's a huge experience gap in this fight at all. Kale got chances to get experience, and instead he depended on the referee to win the fight for him to take the life out of the fight. And then the other time he didn't get much of what four rounds, and the rest was a beating. What two rounds were probably good for him, the rest was a beating. That's experience. No, that's a bad experience. That's a nightmare. That's what that is. Go in there, say, okay, I'll go in a 12 round fight, and before the fourth or fifth round, your eye is your eye socket smashed in. That's not experience. That's a nightmare. And and now you're coming down and waiting. You're gonna deal with somebody who fights like a night. I look at Earl Spence and I say, don't do nothing special. Don't do nothing flashy, but he coming to hurt you though. He come he he knows how to get the hurt business done. I look at him and I say there's more expectation in front and behind Earl Spence. But to me, he Badu Jack. To me, they best body punches in the game. They throw every punch right. They they bring the they bring the punch right back to their face every time they throw it. No, they don't move their heads. You know, they ain't in that swifty head move. But if you hit something, you're gonna have to hit a shoulder in the glove before you get through it. That's the that's the um that's the moniker they trying to get through to their opponents. They say my technique make me not have to do all that razzle dazzle. Badu Jack is Earl Spence. Earl Spence is Badu Jack to me when I watch. And I think Kell Brook about to find out what another UK guy found out, but in a different fashion, because Kell Brook is a stronger fighter. But um He's going to have to fight this time. Like I said, Kel either held or he failed. That's the name. Kel held or failed Brook. That's what I call him. And it's true. And he's going to have to show he can take these body shots. He's going to have to show he can fight on the inside control distance without being able to hold the man and make a man respect that, hey, you really can't come in here because I'm going to tie you up. And if the ref is on the up and up, I think we see the best of the fights. But the main thing that needs to be on the up and up is, is Earl Spence's jab. 
pump it. Don't never stop pumping it. Put it in that eye. Bring back that memory that my shit was broke, and I think it's broke again. And you should have an easy title on your hand. Yeah, um, uh, he he dropped out there. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Gail. Let's let's get your opinion. You know, Bo, I think uh, I look at the fight a lot the same way as you do. I was very impressed when Brooke won over Porter, which was at StubHub Center in Carson. He was he came to the Lions Den to win his belt, and we were surprised, pleasantly surprised to hear and the new. We didn't think it would happen. We we thought it would be tough for him to overcome, you know, just just a home field bias. Well, now we've got the reverse. We have Earl Spence being willing to go into Cal Brooks territory to fight him on his turf. And but he he is fighting a guy who's got a lot of obstacles to overcome and and a lot of them are simply the physical punishment he's taken first outside the ring. I think the stabbing uh, injuries that he endured were a lot worse than we've ever been led to believe. I really I'm do. Good. Do I sound any better? And you barely, <laughs> barely, <laughs> Michael. Well, you know what? We'll muddle along till the end of the show. I think with it so far, almost there. Um, secondly, you know, it's it's funny to me at the time of this of the Brook Golovkin fight. You know, a lot of people sort of poo pooed Triple G's performance. Now we're saying, oh, my God, he, you know, he nearly beat the man to death. And I, he, he launched some very serious punishment on Brooke. You know, when you break an orbital bone in the face, that is no joke. And if any of you have heard Brooke talk about the surgery, the repairs that were done, um, or anything about the injury, I mean, it'll make you squirm in your chair to hear about it. He... He now has a screw in the face, and yeah. that is yeah. just not good. Gil, I heard something about an eyeball had to go through the mouth or some yeah. shit like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking, what the fuck is this happening? It was an ex <laughs> it's excruciating yeah, surgery to hear described. Just horrible, you know, and you think, man, was he conscious for this? Holy shit. Yeah. I, I mean, I give Brooke credit for being an incredibly tough, brave individual. I mean, even talking about going through that sort of surgery about yourself, this is just not good. And, and Brooke is probably too brave for his own good. There are a lot of guys like that. But I can't think that a punch flush to the same area of the face when it's being held together by a screw nah, is nah, going to be nah. anything but bad. And those are career-ending injuries. They really are. He's going to be gun shy, and if Spence, you know, if if Spence is going to ta do target practice to that area, you know, Brooke is going to have to be paying attention. He is going to be distracted because a little piece of his attention is always going to be on that face and protecting that area. He just he can't help it. It's that's just a human being's, you know nature to, to protect where you know you're weak that's going to leave brooke open to the body i don't think we're going to see any spectacular one punch knockout or anything like that i think we are going to see damage by attrition and i think spence will stop him in the later rounds with brooke putting up absolutely the best effort he can muster nobody ever says that kel brooke does less than you know give what he's got uh, which will make it very entertaining for us but i think spence will turn the tables and win on enemy turf. And you know, sometimes that's easier because there's no pressure on him. He knows that he's going to hear booze in the arena. He knows everybody's going to be rooting for the other guy. In a way that, that lightens the load a little bit on him. It's, it's a good situation for him. And then that makes that division very, very interesting. And I also agree with you, Bo, you know, he, he fought well at the middleweight, uh, you know, division. He's really a natural 154 at this point. I can't believe he's, I mean, he's very disciplined. I'm sure he'll get down to 147 tomorrow, but damn, not easily, not easily. I just, everything's stacked against him, unfortunately. It really is. You know, and I, I agree with you, Gail. And here's, here's one thing I want everybody to keep in mind is uh, that 
I, I always hear people say to me, well, you know, Earl, look at Earl Spence's resume. Well, he's a prospect. Who, who do you expect a prospect having a resume? But when you look at Carol Brooks' resume, before Golovkin, he only had Sean Porter. And, you know, that's, that's not, right. Their, re their <laughs> resumes, honestly, are very, very even. Really. Yeah. yeah. So I, I definitely and, agree with you. And you know what? There, it's interesting. There's not that much of an age difference. Uh, Brooks, 31. Spence is 27. So as far as maturity goes, you know, that's dead, dead even. Um, you know what I haven't checked is the uh, number of number of rounds they've fought. So okay, so Kel Brook has fought a total of 184 rounds, and Spence Jr. just 77. That's where the real difference lies. Um, let yeah. me um, see if I can get my yeah. prediction see. before my mic goes all the way out. Um, no, that that sounds great, Michael. You're I was just good. I was I was just going to say uh, I, I see Michael from Pound for Pound Boxing has joined us. Mike, go ahead, man. I'll, I'll turn it back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love it. Love it. I had to, I had to check out and, and and try to reboot back in. But yeah, um, I'm going with I'm going with Spence here. I'm going with Spence by um, late round stoppage, um, 10, 11. Um, I, I I just think the all around game of of Errol Spence. He's faster than you think. Um, he's he can get hit with shots, and I think that Brooke is going to hit him with shots. I think it's going to be a very good fight, by the way. Um, I think Brooke is actually going to step up, but I just think it's Errol spends time. Um, I love the body work, and I think that Brooke, who we all know have issues making weight, fighting a guy in Spence who can go to the body, a guy this size because Errol Spence is no small welts of weight in his own right. He's a guy who looks like he could fight at 154 himself. Um, I just think that body work will be a key. I think the jab is better. Um, you just Lofkin. I just think that Errol Spence is the best fighter. Uh, Kell Brook has fought in terms, you know, uh, Kell Brook is the best fighter, fighter that Errol Spence has ever fought. But I just think that it's just some guys that you see, um, it's their time. Um, they're on a mission. They're hungry. Uh, they're really ready for it. And they're going to go through hellfire and brimstone, brimstone to get it. Um, to me, this is Hagler mentor. Hagler was so determined. He just would not be denied. He was going to go through whatever and whoever until he gets his, until he got the middleweight title. Um, I think this is the same scenario with, um, Errol Spence. I just think he's going to do it. And once he gets that belt, um, watch out welterweights because he's going to rule the roost in that division. And we've already talked about how. Uh, uh, Thurman talks all around Spence. It really mention, doesn't mention him. We talked about how Angel Garcia really talks about everybody and their mama doesn't mention him. Um, he's that dude that they fear. Um, and I think he's going to get it. And once he get it, he's going to dominate. I, I was thinking like, um, I forgot to say this point when I spoke of him, but he done everything right. 25% yeah. took it. Go overseas, fine. You know, like really acted like a challenger. So even if he go over there and get knocked out in one punch, I don't want to hear a hype job. I don't want to hear that. I, I want to say thank you for doing what most Danny Jacobs wouldn't do. Danny Jacobs wouldn't take the fight unless he got all of this. Earl taking his first shot, saying, look, you ain't got to give me nothing but a chance to win this belt. And he's been doing that ever since Kale was healthy, unhealthy, whatever. Kell Brook, when it was his chance to fight for a title, he, he, shit, he, so much shit he did with Devin Alexander, you can almost still hate him today. You don't know what was going on. Man, Earl did everything right. So I'm talking about even if he go over there and, and quit in the third round, well, that maybe that's harsh. But if he get in there and get knocked out, I don't care. I support that. I support it. Better come back stronger because he did everything right. He acted like a challenger trying to be a champion. I support that any day. Um, I didn't hear your commentary, uh, uh, Daniel. Oh, we, I was. This is going to be a fun event because for a lot of fans, uh, the UK fans, they seem to think that this is going to be another Joe Calzaghe, Jeff Lacey situation. Well, everyone minus EJ. Yeah. Minus CJ, but we had to force CJ to see the truth at one point. Well, uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just got to say, because I've been hearing that all day, and th th that's fucking stupid. 
to say something like that. It is it, fucking stupid because a number one, Cal Brooks is no Joe Calzaghe, and if anybody know boxing, you know goddamn well there's more dimensions you've seen out of Earl Spence than you ever saw out of Joe Calzaghe. So when I people say that, that's like that's just fucking stupid to me when I hear that. I'm tired of hearing it. Yo, Frank Warren said that man. That's like you can go argue with Frank Warren. Frank Warren said that. Man. Uh, uh, he, he, yeah, he Frank Warren ain't the only one. He ain't the yeah, only one. There's been yeah, plenty of the people major, with UK major, addresses that have said that. Yeah, he's the major on the board that can't uh, conspire. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, well, like I said I, I'm not gonna say this. Well, no, I am gonna say that you, you're a fucking dumbass if you think that. If you if you if you're really thinking that oh Errol Spence is just another hype job another Jeff Lacey, and Brooke is our Kawasaki like you really want to go there you really want to go there when the resumes safe for a couple of fights are pretty much even yeah Brooke has Golovkin but he fucked up in the Golovkin's weight. And granted, yes, Brooke has Porter, but Spence ain't Porter. He'll come in and knock you out any. And the best part is probably what I would probably give the edge to Spence. There is a mean streak in that man's body. Same mean streak that is this in Bud Crawford, by the way. It just shows itself differently, but. With Spence, there's just a meanness. When he knows he hurts you, he will not stop. He will not stop until he knows he has you out. <sighs> and you have to watch that part about the orbital bone, like Gail mentioned. That part right there, when you have a part of your, the part of your body that your eyes sit into it has a screw in it. That's gonna be a target for a kid with a mean streak like Spence. I'm not. It's not gonna be a wash by any means. Kel Brook has earned his place as a champion. Like he's done everything he had to as a champion. He's fought his mandatories. He took a challenge, a guy that it was, it was the weight class didn't want to take it, and Golovkin. But Spence is just different. In the sense of the fact that you don't see somebody that's a southpaw, by the way, natural southpaw, that has that meanness in him where he wants to just flat out hurt you any chance he gets. And that's it's going to be a bomb burner. Both guys are going to test each other. But I do think that Spence is going to finish it out late. And it's going to be a pretty thrilling fight. And... Thanks to Keith Thurman having surgery, he's probably gonna be the man by default. Almost by default. Like it almost depends how Pacquiao looks versus Horn, but it'll almost be by default that Spence will be seen as a man in the division until the fight with Thurman happens. If it happens. <laughs> yes. If it happens. <clears throat> That's a key word. If. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we all unanimous here in our, our, our predictions. I think we're all going with um um Errol Spence here. Interesting that um even though Brooke is the champion, um the bookies have uh, um Errol Spence as the uh, uh favorite, um either in both there in the UK as well as here in the US. So um I think we're going to uh tie a bow um on the show and and and, and a wrap. I'm going to go around the um, panel here. I'll speak for Gail. Gail had to uh, dip out on us. Uh, she had to leave a little bit early. Um, if you want to follow Gail on Twitter, PR Pro uh, San Diego. She writes for Community Digital News, uh, which is based out of Washington, D.C. Com, News, uh, dot com, I believe it is. So uh, if you want to check her out and talk boxing or uh, talk dancing with the stars or environmental issues she's big on the environment that's where you want to check her out um you want to check out low uh scorsese uh, if you want to follow him on twitter it's at my low place if you want to follow him on um, g plus youtube he has a channel there where he talks boxing um hashtag mlpf 
Um, I'll go around the rest of the folks here, starting with you, EJ Boxing Live. Join us live from the UK for folks who want to talk sweet science, who want to talk boxing. Um, you're training young fighters now. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you. Yeah, EJ Boxing, you catch me on the Instagram. Uh, you catch me on YouTube. Uh, yeah, you catch me on Twitter. Um, yeah, training fighters is pretty, it's hard work, man. That's hard work, wearing a lot. I also do scoring, like I judge, judge uh, amateur bouts and keep the ring, uh, do um, timekeeping as well. So, yeah, man, it's not easy, but I, right, hey, someone's going to do it. You got to make sure that the right judges are there so that amateurs, um, the right guy wins. And listen, man, I ain't going to lie to you, bro. What time is it? It's like nearly five in the morning. It's so hot over here in the UK. It's going to be hot over there at the weigh-in. And boy, like, and I appreciate you coming. I, don't, I haven't been on the show for a while, but boy, you know, sometimes when the power pounds are out and, and this arrow spectrum is heating up, I had to jump on the show. So I appreciate you guys uh, for you letting me come on the mic and uh, great show, Mike. Uh, no problem. No problem. And thank you. Um, um, both from Truth and Facts about boxing for folks who want to talk to Sweet Science or um, follow the adventures of you and your, and your daughter. I keep saying it. Um, that's a live YouTube show, web series in waiting. Um, let the folks know where they can hit you up. They can find me at uh, Truth and Fact About Boxing at YouTube. And uh, you can also find me on Twitter at capital T for truth underscore capital F for fact box one. And Instagram at uh, lowercase truth underscore fact box one. You can also find me on the Movement Podcast with 2K the Guy from the Gods of Boxing, my man Twine from Who Jab and Jasper from Colossal Boxing, along with my partner in crime. Bernard, and you can uh, uh, find me uh, on Ring IQ Hands of Fire podcast, along with right here with some some other good boxing minds. And you, like you said, you can also catch me on Facebook with my daughter. It it it, it has been dubbed the Human Tom and Jerry Show. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely catch us there. And uh, I just want to say that look, I always appreciate you guys having me here. I, I came on. The first time, extremely nervous, and I, I, it, it's, it said something. It means more to me being on shows like this with people like you all and my peers than to be recognized by, you know, somebody high up the chain because this is where boxing is for me. This is where boxing is at its truest form. There's no agenda. There's no, you know, no malice toward fighters or back and forth towards fighters. And uh, Scorsese isn't here. I would say something if he was here, but he's not here, so I, I can't mess with a guy when he's not here. But there's uh, a... <laughs> But this 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 really means a lot to me that you guys have allowed me to come on and invited me in. And hey, EJ, hey, I, EJ, I know you have the, the the what you call it going. I just don't be having time to be on it. It'd be so many messages coming across that thing. But I'm gonna get on there one day, EJ, and I'm gonna need I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna need you to come on the show. And, the, and you also in, in in the app game developing some maps. Um, quick word about that, Bo. Oh, um, we still got the four four apps. We're trying to develop a boxing one. But we have the four apps. One's basketball. One is uh, like it's kind of like Candy Crush, but it, it has more dimensions to it because instead of doing three, you can do seven, ten, and eight. The other one is a um, it's Hunter versus Zombie, so it's for kids. They can ride a motorcycle and be shooting jump zombies, or they can be running. And the uh, very, very last one, I forgot. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> I forgot. But yeah, we got they're both for Android and for iTunes. If you want to look at them, just type in, go to your game store and just type in Apollonia Media and you will see all the games we're developing. And like I said, we're working on a boxing one. So just, you know, doing things. But I, I just can't thank you guys enough, man. I really enjoy being here. Yeah, ah, no problem. No problem. Love to have you on. Yeah, that's cool, bro, man. Yeah, like anytime. Don't worry about it, bro. When you can make it, like, that's cool. I'll jump on your show um, when you're ready as well. Like, no problem, man. And just be sure to stick on for a couple minutes um, after the show. Uh, Bo got a couple of questions. I go to you, Daniel, from the Inscriber, for folks who want to talk uh, boxing, who want to talk uh, politics, who want to talk the NBA, specifically the Miami Heat. And spe speaking of the Miami Heat, I saw something on during the Cleveland game tonight I thought I'd never see. Um, Ex-Miami Heat, James Jones, actually dunk in a game. Um, so, yeah, if we want to talk about all those things, um, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, yes, folks, you can find me on Twitter at Rockets99. Took a long hiatus from writing. I'm trying to get back in it, luckily, because it's the summer. Obviously, big, the big news is the Heat and Chris Bosch are working towards a resolution where they'll free up the cap space that Bosch had currently has on the team. 
but definitely you can catch me on. Uh, you catch me sometimes with EJ on his podcast. Unfortunately, I was as sick as a dog this weekend, so I wasn't there at all for to help him out for any of the cards here stateside. But uh, but definitely catch me on there. Catch me here. Catch me on my show, like I think Sundays and Mondays, with folks at Four Boxing News, Jordan Francis. We're definitely going to be talking about this fight and previewing Scorsese's favorite fighter. Stevenson. With Adonis Stevenson rematching Andre Fonfara. On six. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Uh, for folks who want to talk um, boxing, who want to talk music, or follow me in my um, uh, fitness travels, uh, brother getting in shape. Uh, <laughs> You follow me on Twitter, um, brother J. You, you know what it is, brother Jr. Um, at the at brother Jr. Seven six on Twitter. Um, as I stated to begin the show, if you want to find out all things regarding pound for pound boxing report, the blog page blog page is the place you want to go to. P four P boxing report dot com. Um, again, check the rival page. You can find links to the pages on Facebook, on Tumblr, on YouTube, G plus Twitter, as well as where to listen to us on Sound cloud itunes stitcher google play music player fm um on the next episode where we do a recap of brooke spence do a preview of um the stevenson fun for a rematch and just letting folks know um i'm in the process we've had two episodes of ladies of boxing show um one last year one in 2015 i'm Working behind the scenes to set up another episode, round three of the Ladies Love Boxing show. Ladies Love Boxing episode, pound for pound box report. Hopefully, I hope to do it next month. Uh, trying to round out guests as we speak. So yeah, uh, there you go. Episode 170, pound for pound box report. I want to thank Gail. I want to thank Scorsese. The homie EJ Boxing Live, joining us live from the UK. The homie Bo from Truth and Facts About Boxing. Uh, the homie Daniel from The Inscriber. Thank Jacob from uh, Jab Hook Boxer from listening to us live. He was the one who asked the question about Tete and the newer that had everybody like, ooh. Uh, so, yeah, episode 170 in the book. We will see you next week. I'm your host, Michael. Uh, we will see you next time. Everyone have a good evening. Good night. Night, folks.